be next to this word of tea today. As long as Good afternoon. The Senate Finance Committee is now in session. And our first bill for the afternoon is Senate Bill 295. Senator Gallion, you're on. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hello, and hello, uh, Vice Chair and committee members. A good afternoon for the record. Senator Jason Gallion here to introduce Senate Bill 295, Maryland Medical Assistance Program, Emergency Service Transporters Reimbursement. For over 20 years, the Medicaid reimbursement rate for emergency medical services has been fixed at $100 per transport. An increase to this rate is long overdue. A lot changes in 20 years, especially costs. Prices of ambulances, supplies, and other necessary tools our first responders need to provide adequate service in emergency situations has risen drastically. Also, volunteer ambulance company crews are normally supplemented by paid EMS providers. This is the case in my home county in Harford County, uh, which started doing that roughly 15 years ago. And I know I served as eight years as the budget chair uh, there at Level Volunteer Fire Company and saw that increase year after year uh, in the costs going up. So the bill that uh, is being introduced today would do three things, two of which you've heard before, and then and one additional. Number one, it would gradually increase the reimbursement rate for transports of Medicaid patients by $25 a year, starting in FY23 for eight years until the rate reaches $300 in FY2030, which is on par with surrounding states. The second thing it would do is allow for reimbursement for treat and release or treat but not transport of Medicaid patients. These cases have unfortunately become quite common during the opioid crisis as our providers come out and offer on-site treatment, but the patient refuses care and transport, excuse me, refuses transport to a healthcare facility. And the third thing it would do in a new addition to previous versions of this bill, it would allow for the reimbursement of mobile integrated health. Mobile integrated health is when EMS partners with other healthcare professionals, such as nurse practitioners, community health workers, social workers, and physicians to conduct home visits to assess, treat, and refer low acuity patients with chronic conditions who frequently call 911 needed services in the community. Mobile integrated health programs can also focus on patients identified by hospitals as being at high risk for hospital readmission. There are currently 11 jurisdictions in the state that util utilize motor mobile integrative health programs. They are Baltimore City, Montgomery County, Prince George's, Howard, Frederick, Anne Arundel, Queen Anne's, Talbot, Charles, Worcester, and Cecil. An actuarial study was completed in 2019 on the new models of EMS care and the potential cost impact of, cost impact of mandating private payer coverage for these services. The study was completed by the Maryland Healthcare Commission at the request of the Health and Gover Government Operations and the Senate Finance Committees. That study concluded that issuing a, a private payer mandate for coverage of new models of EMS care services could result in cost savings. While it slightly leads, while it's slightly different issues in, that we're addressing in this bill, we are talking about Medicaid patients only in this bill. It leads to the notion that in the long run, coverage of these new models will lead to cost savings. So you might ask, how could it save costs? A provision of the mobile integrated health services and transportation of Medicaid recipients with low acuity health conditions to urgent care centers rather than emergency departments will likely result in savings due to offsets in emergency room utilization and hospital admissions that would reduce Medicaid expenditures. It would also help a, a big problem we're having in the state right now is the wait time in emergency rooms. So that could help alleviate some of that too. We've heard uh, stories of ambulances having to wait, you know, a couple hours to unload patients in an ER. And that's uh, that much longer before that ambulance is back in service to handle 
uh, other calls. This bill also requires the Maryland Department of Health to study the adequacy of the rate of reimbursement for mobile integrative health services and report its findings and recommendations to the governor and the General Assembly by November of 2023. Medicaid advises that this study can be completed using existed, existing budgeted resources. Uh, I've had a chance to be in the fire service for almost 30 years now, and Maryland is known uh, for its world-class EMS system. We cannot expect that same level of service in the year 2022 and beyond while funding this essential service at 1999 levels. Our first responders hit the road every time the call for help comes out, all hours of day and night, all kinds of weather, and they've truly been on the front lines the previous two years during the COVID-19 pandemic. We need to ensure our first responders are funded appropriately. I respectfully urge the committee to give this bill that is essential for our first responders, Senate Bill 295, a favorable ruling. I thank you and would like to turn it over to uh, the panel. Uh, let me uh, ask a question before we turn over, if you don't mind, Mr. Sure. Um I worry about, and I hope you can relieve some of my worry, uh, these folks who are depending on Medicaid uh, being turned away uh, with a report that says they refuse service. What can we do to guarantee that they understand the level of acuity of the situation that caused them to, to have the first responders come out in the first place and that they understand uh, the relevance of what it is they're doing in terms of their health outcomes in the long run? Sure. So nobody's going to be refused service. So whoever the patient is, whether they have, are a Medicaid patient or have private insurance, they make that 911 call, they're going to get that service. What this bill would do is make sure that those providers are appropriately funded for providing that service. So no, no one on Medicaid is going to be refused a service or anything. It, what it would do is help these EMS companies uh, be able to uh, get that funding uh, from Medicaid so they can uh, take care of their, their daily bills. I, I was just referring to the second big point you made, though, where you talk about the patient refusing transport. And, you know, uh, when you're really ill and you're not in good shape and you don't know the probable outcomes if you get service or if you stay at home, um, you easily could be subject to suggestion or to the attitudes that uh, uh, people might have. I'm, I'm sure that nobody's gonna overtly deny them service. What can we do to be sure they understand what their, their acuity level really requires and that they don't through ignorance tell you, well, go away, I don't need anything, when in fact they might be in critical condition. Sure, and the, and the folks that, you know, I, I, I drove an ambulance crew for years and we dealt with, uh, you know, uh, something with this uh, quite often. A lot of times if a patient has a condition that's not, you know, say they have a little headache or, you know, something more minor and they say, well, I don't, I'm not sure if I wanna go to the hospital, the provider will go over their options with them and they say, well, I don't really think I need to go. That provider needs to make sure they get a signed uh, refusal that covers the provider so they're you know, not held in neglect later on. So I think our providers, you know, I trust their judgment and their, if, if it's a, a serious condition, you know, they're not gonna try to encourage somebody not to go to the hospital. But if it's not a very serious condition, just of something very minor that could be handled uh, without going to the ER, you know, they'll, they'll talk that over with the patient and if they decide that's what's best, uh, the patient would actually sign that refusal. So, you know, okay. I, I have full comments in our- reasonable. Let me just ask one last thing. Sure. Would the fire company come out in the first place if it's really minor, somebody's got a um, headache and they could take a pill? Yeah, uh, you'd be surprised at what all they get called out for. I can tell you in my experience, we had a, uh, a blizzard one year and, uh, we had to push the snow to get back to the house. And then the person, you know, the person had, I forget what the, the, uh, what they called for, but then they decided they wanted to refuse mm -hmm. service, but they had their driveway plowed. So it does, it happens at, at times where someone will call 911. The other thing, someone, uh, you know, a family member might call and, uh, 
and, and have a concern and uh, the, the actual patient themselves says, now, nah, you know, I, I don't think I, I need to go to the hospital. Uh, but, you know, our first responders are well trained. Um, you know, the training now to just to become an EMT, I forget, you know, it's probably at least a couple hundred hours now, uh, where, you know, 20 years ago was probably in the low hundred. So, you know, they're well, well trained, well qualified, and they're going to, you know, their first priority is patient care and they want to do what's best for the patient. And sometimes what's best for the patient might not be going to the ER, which, uh, you know, we've had a big issue, as I mentioned in my statements, with wait times at hospital ERs. And a lot of that, uh, you know, we've heard of folks with minor things going to the ER for every little thing. And, and that really floods the system. Your ambulance is stuck, stuck there at times, you know, having to wait to unload for a long while. And while that ambulance is stuck there out of service, you know, they can't go to a, another call in the area. So then you have to bring resources from farther away. So it really snowballs it. So we're kind of looking at an all above approach to really help with our issues with EMS. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's yes, go to the rest of your panel. Theodore Delbridge. Good afternoon. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak about Senate Bill 295. Uh, so I'm Dr. Ted Delbridge. I'm the executive director for the Maryland Institute for Emergency Medical Services Systems. And we are charged with coordinating the statewide EMS system. And Senate Bill 295 proposes two important steps. First, it recognizes the value of care provided by EMTs and paramedics, regardless of whether the patient is taken to a hospital including efforts to avert an emergency by deployment of mobile integrated health teams. The current prerequisite for payment from Medicaid that the patient be taken to a hospital indirectly incentivizes EMS agencies and their personnel to take patients to the most expensive place, which is often resource constrained. And Senate Bill 295 helps to right that wrong, providing Medicaid payments when the, pay, when the right care is provided, including when such care obviates the immediate need to go to an emergency department or when transport to an urgent care center or other alternative would suffice. Secondly, it begins a slow process to update the rate EMS is paid for the services it provides. The current payment of $100 has been the same for more than 20 years. Senate Bill 295 proposes a series of incremental increases that will still take years to overcome the inflationary erosion of the value of a $1999. I wanna make note that fiscal and policy note you received makes mention of the emergency service supplemental, uh, transporter supplemental payment program. I hope you don't incorrectly conclude that because of that, Senate Bill 295 is not needed. The supplemental payment program is a cost recovery program. The federal government reimburses public agency tax dollars supported Medicaid providers for its share, which is 50% of the difference between what Medicaid reimbursed and the actual cost of delivering that service. While 14 of Maryland's 28 jurisdictions are participating, none have yet to receive any funds. Moreover, this program currently benefits mostly urban and suburban jurisdictions. It does not help at all EMS agencies in Garrett, Washington, Carroll, much of Harford, Cecil, Charles, St. Mary's, Calvert, Kent, Somerset, Wicomico, or Worcester counties. It's appropriate that this body recognizes the value EMS provides in maintaining the health of communities, including Medicaid beneficiaries. MEM supports Senate Bill 295 and respectfully requests a favorable report. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any questions? Okay, see no hands. Dominique Bochapa. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, my name is Dominic Butchko. I'm an Associate Policy Director at the Maryland Association of Counties. Uh, great to be before you here again today. Uh, Mako asks that the committee give SB 295 a favorable report. Um, this is actually a Mako 2022 legislative initiative. So just a quick thank you to Senator Gallion for taking this issue so seriously. It is incredibly important to counties and to our communities. Mm -hmm. um, the COVID-19 pandemic has stressed the importance of EMS in our healthcare system. I just want to highlight, less than a month ago, hospitals were asking people to stay away due to capacity limits. Local EMS companies were pleading with the public not to call 911 unless it was a dire emergency. And again, this was just a few weeks ago. Um, this bill addresses major shortfalls in our healthcare system. We need to support our local first responders and the innovative programs and services they're providing amid this global pandemic. Um, I wanna skip over my explanation of the program. Senator Gallion did a beautiful job of that, but this, primarily this bill does two things. It alleviates strain on our system and it modernizes billing. In short, when you call 911, you expect an ambulance to arrive on time and provide transport and treatment. If we neglect to take action soon, we are putting that timely response at risk. And accordingly, MAKO asks for a favorable report. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, let me ask you one question. Uh, if we were to add an amendment to at, at the end of each year, um, list the number, the categories of people who once haven't been seen by the emergency folks who have to come out, uh, decide not to uh, go to uh, a health center, even if it's recommended. Mm -hmm. uh, so we would know how many of those people are on the public dole there, Medicaid, as opposed to others with private insurance. Uh, would that be possible? I, I do not see how that would be an issue, especially if we're already collecting um, the, the waivers. Um, I am gonna defer to other members on the panel though. They might have more technical knowledge. Okay. All right. If anybody else on the panel wants to answer that before we move on to the next uh, very important uh, uh, proponent. I'll, I'll take a Delbert. quick stab at it. The, the, the EMS clinicians at the scene, the EMTs and paramedics don't generally collect payer information at that time. Um, they're, they are agnostic to how somebody's going to pay the bill. And so if we were to, to attempt to identify the payer source at the scene, um, I would be concerned about uh, how that might in, indirectly influence a decision by an EMS clinician to make one move or another. I would, it, it's just important for the committee to recognize that they don't collect that information. So they don't know until after the work is done how a bill was going to get paid or if at all. Okay, that, that's helpful. Uh, I didn't think necessarily that they influenced the person, but I think that patients who know they're poor and are dealing with uh, a public service that they are afraid might not be paid for, might decide to let their health care fl flounder rather than to maybe end up with, with a turn down or with, with, with some, okay. All right, um, I don't see any questions. So we're going next to our former colleague, uh, Barry Glassman. Good afternoon, Madam Chairwoman. It is so good to see you. Good to be seen. Uh, it's good to see you, even with your mask on, but I'm hoping when things get better, I'll get down to see you before too long. Um, and it's good to see a lot of my older committee mates uh, and younger ones that are on the committee. So it's good to see everybody uh, today. Uh, real quickly, Hartford County is in full support of um, Senate Bill 295. Uh, and I wanna thank Senator Gallion. We have one thing in common, Madam Chairwoman. We, we both joined Level Fire Company when we were 16. Uh, I did it about 30 years before he did. So uh, I'm a lot older, but we, uh, we kind of followed that same path and grew up in the same uh, community. Listen, Harford County is uh, really unique in some respect. We have volunteer fire companies that handle EMS calls. We have a hybrid system, a foundation, an EMS foundation that handles calls. And then about five years ago, because the county was growing into such a suburban county, we actually have a Harford County paid uh, paramedic EMS service. So I, I have about three different parties providing uh, services here in Harford County. Uh, and just two points I will make is the bill uh, does provide at least a predictable uh, new increase each year so that we can uh, begin to plan for those increases in our reimbursement levels. Um, no secret, when I came to county government, I realized that the fire and EMS services are, are one of those services that cost a great deal of money, uh, not only in equipment, uh, ambulances now you have to wait six months for, uh, and can push towards a half a million dollars just for an equipped uh, BLS unit uh, in a county. Uh, the other point I would make where these reimbursements will help our system is just like we're seeing across the country in labor shortages, recruitment and retention of paramedics, EMS, uh, and all those providers is becoming more competitive and we're seeing the salary base grow and grow. So it's costing more each year uh, to provide these EMS services to actually get a crew dispatched and to a citizen is one of the cost leaders in local government uh, to provide. The other quick point I'd make uh, on the point of integrated health management and mobile health management, 
Uh, about six years ago, we created the, the state's first crisis center for behavioral health and mental health. Uh, so we could actually dispatch and, and pick up whether it's an adolescent or an adult and get them to our mental health crisis center, not to the hospital, it's, it's located nearby. Uh, but over time, we've realized that we cannot be reimbursed for that. Uh, uh, even, and, and I've dealt, talked to the Senate president, even if an adolescent has to spend a night at a crisis center, it's not reimbursable. Uh, and, and so we've got to find a way to help uh, our paramedics and our first responders out there to at least be able to treat on the scene and get some cost recovery uh, that's so we can keep that kind of service up. And I think in the future, it's going to be more and more important uh, that we have that kind of mobile health care out there. Uh, and so uh, I think it's a good bill. It's a good start. Uh, it has a predictable amount for the state budget to, so we can measure. Uh, and, and I do think, uh, Madam Chairwoman, that through the various collection agencies that uh, departments use and counties use and so forth, they can probably capture that data for you on the billing and, and who, who has been billed, who's paid and at what rate and so forth. Uh, I don't think you need an amendment. I think that's something that uh, the association or MIMS can get that for you. So, uh, so I'm in favor of the bill. It's good to see everyone. I'd be glad to answer any questions if there's anything left. I, I do have one. Uh, Matt, I'm thinking about it. You mentioned the volunteers as opposed to the professional firefighters. From where I live in Baltimore County, that's what I'm covered by, volunteers to the north and volunteers to the south. And they get next to nothing. They have to hold fundraisers and what They even buy their own engines. They have to do everything. Right. Um, what, if anything, would you recommend uh, to make things fairer for the volunteer companies who really are saving the taxpayers and are doing everything as volunteers that, that the rest are, are paid for by the counties and so on. Yeah, and I, Madam Chair, I would, I would say in Hartford County, we, we actually, although the fire departments do do some fundraising, I think Baltimore County, much like Hartford County, we do a lot of, we uh, a lot, a great deal of capital funds for the purchase of equipment. Uh, what, what we're finding in Hartford County and, and even in your rural jurisdictions is uh, volunteer companies because of the training requirements uh, and the time requirement to handle a call, maybe eight hours, uh, that volunteer service in that EMS profession is becoming kind of a thing of the past. Most folks that ride these ambulances now are, are paid contract. Or, or paid to some degree. So the reimbursement levels are just as important for the volunteers because they get paid per call, per, tr uh, per transport also. So it really probably means more to them. Uh, in Hartford County, even though I may pay someone to ride a volunteer ambulance to provide that service, the volunteer company gets that reimbursement because it's in their ambulance and the transport is theirs. And so, uh, this bill would mean a lot to volunteer companies also. Okay, well, I might have Baltimore County take a look at how you're doing it, because in where I live, I'm dependent totally on volunteers who getting nothing from the county. Okay, <laughs> uh, let, are there questions for this witness? All right, Tom Coe. Good to see everybody. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today in support of Senate Bill 295. My name is Tom Coe, the Fire Chief and Division Director for Fire and Rescue Services in Frederick County. In the many years since the last update of reimbursement rates within the Maryland Medical Assistance Program, Maryland's emergency medical services have been called on at an increasing rate to respond to situations of greater complexity. The medical care EMS units provide has a growing and important role in providing on-site medical care to patients and in transporting patients to facilities beyond hospital emergency rooms. This level of activity requires operating at the highest level of readiness in order to support a high level of medical care. We are constantly inspecting and testing equipment and conducting staff training to ensure that high level of care. EMS services has evolved to be an integral and important to healthcare and healthcare access. 
so much so that the provision of emergency medical ser services now includes a specialty that ensures immediate patient-centered care in home with mobile resources and has garnered a name reflective of this heightened role, mobile integrated healthcare. In providing this mobile integrated healthcare, EMS has played a critical and much needed proactive role in keeping our residents safe. As just one example, our EMS crews have vaccinated over 2,000 homebound seniors in Frederick County against COVID-19. This example underscores the changing needs of our communities and challenges to access for our healthcare system. <clears throat> Thank you again, and I urge a favorable report for Senate Bill 295. Thank you. Are there any questions? Madam Chair? Yes. Sorry, I couldn't find my button. I just wanted to point out, uh, Mr. Coe is a constituent of mine, even though he, he does Fred, works in Frederick County. Uh, Tom, could you just comment, uh, this, the chair just made a comment about volunteers in her area not getting really any help from the county, but I know in some of our communities, we're, we're having to rely more and more on county governments to help subsidize and put paid staff in to help the fire stations. And I love our volunteers, as you know. I mean, obviously, our, our Carroll County is a rich tradition with volunteer fire departments, but the, the recruitment has struggled. Could you just comment on that and how this might help with offsetting some of those costs for helping? Yeah, the, the cost for emergency medical care continue to increase as we add uh, complexities of care into the field. So this will help garner much needed funds to help support those efforts and providing that high level of care to our EMS agencies, be it career, be it county compensated, be it compensated at a, a, through a corporation. Uh, this will affect all of them positively in continuing to be able to provide that care. Uh, that, that's very important. Uh, I'd like to just ask the, the sponsor of this good bill, um, if you would care if there were an amendment added to make sure that volunteers will be helped if they're the ones providing the service to the same degree that the count re regular county employee firefighters would. Madam Chair, you know, that's where I come from, the volunteer, and uh, I, you know, be willing to work with you to, uh, you know, anything we can do because they, you know, they, they do need help with the funding. And uh, one, one thing I wanted to bring up, uh, there was some talk about the uh, Emergency Service Transporter Supplemental Payment Program. Well, you know, the a lot of these volunteer companies, they're not eligible uh, for that. As a matter of fact, um, most of the ineligible providers for, through that program are commercial services and volunteer fire departments, uh, as they do not uh, have qualifying state-based expenditures. So this bill is super important for the volunteers, would really help them. Thank you. All right, Stephen Watts. Chair, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, see you from Carroll County. Uh, just, uh, I'm, I'm Carroll County Commissioner Steve Wance, and by the way, Madam Chair, I'm a retired Baltimore County firefighter, and uh, I'm on year 47 as a volunteer in Carroll County. I also serve on the Federal Emergency Management Agency Region 3. I'm the elected rep on there, uh, which takes up the Delmarva region and includes DC, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. And this allows me to be in direct dialogue with my peers in this region. An insight that is priceless as an emergency first responder. I truly believe we in Maryland, when passing this legislation, will put us back in the lead in the region. And we will be the example to follow by all as we correct a reimbursement process that hasn't been addressed since 1999. Every jurisdiction in the state, as you have heard, is struggling with the strain of emergency medical care leading to many of us searching frantically for funding to ensure that what I strongly believe is our number one priority as elected officials is achieved. And that's absolutely first class emergency care. And in this region, that means a lot. We have the best trauma care in the world and there should be no substitute when it comes to this. Since 1999, we as emergency providers have changed nearly every detail of response to incidents as a result of advanced training and responsibilities, where in some cases, mitigation is accomplished on the scene without transport, relaxing the burden on our hospital systems everywhere in the state. But yet, when we do that, no reimbursement. 
Should we not be reimbursed appropriately as a result of this impressive response? The answer is a clear yes. It's past time to raise uh, a 1999 reimbursement process to the level of our first responders here in Maryland. And uh, right now they're like miles apart. So as every jurisdiction continues to be challenges, challenged with costs associated with delivering emergency care, there should be no doubt in your minds that this is the most important tool right now in the medical toolbox and puts you folks in the driver's seat in our ambulances. So uh, we in Carroll County strongly support this. Again, uh, I've served in every capacity here in Carroll as a, as a volunteer, as well as my career in Baltimore County. I know the struggles financially that we're, we're experiencing and uh, cost recovery is incredibly crucial right now. And that's what this bill does. And I thank my brother in fire service, Senator Gallion, for sponsoring this, uh, this important bill. So uh, again, we in Carroll County strongly support this. And I'm respectfully urging uh, that you, Madam Chair, and the committee give Senate Bill 295 a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going next to Laura Price. Oh, good afternoon, Madam Chair Kelly and committee members. My name is Laura Price, and I'm president of the Maryland Association of Counties and Councilwoman for Talbot County, requesting a favorable report on Senate Bill 295. As you've heard last month, due to a surge in COVID cases, Talbot County EMS issued a joint statement with many other counties pleading with the public to only call 911 in cases of true emergencies. The Eastern Shore experienced what metropolitan areas have for many years, with average wait times of 45 minutes and at times up to three hours from arrival at the hospital until our EMS professionals could hand over patient care when normally it's 10 minutes. We can't let that happen again. But the worst part is that we're funding our emergency medical services with a reimbursement rate that is not adequate. Currently, the spike is down but I believe this demonstrates the need to have alternatives approved and SB 295 would ensure that the state is reimbursing the critical functions of EMS at a fair and modernized rate, one that is responsive to our needs and future challenges that we will most surely face. This bill would allow for mobile integrated health, allow for the billing of treatment in a field that mirrors the transport reimbursement, and allow for transport to other appropriate locations, such as an urgent care facility. In my 11 years on the council, I've always been extremely supportive of emergency services and have witnessed the treatment given to loved ones. But until you experience it for yourself, you can't fully appreciate just how knowledgeable our paramedics are. Just before Christmas, 911 was called for me, and I was in awe at how much medical care was given to stabilize me before I ever left the driveway. Though I was transported to an ER, it's imperative that we have the capability to compensate these true health professionals for treatment in the field. And under our current system, this doesn't happen and that needs to change. So members of this committee, please help us ensure that when you or your family call 911, our EMS can respond in time. And for these reasons, MAKO is asking that you find SB 295 favorable. Thank you so much, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. I see that Senator Augustine has the question. I do. Thank you. It's a broader question. I'm just curious the percentage of the calls that are received that are actually Medicaid related calls. I'm just curious. Anyone can answer. I'm not sure of those numbers, I, you know, certain areas probably uh, more prevalent, you know, um, other areas have a lot of, you know, you know, service by private insurance. So um, I don't know if uh, Mr. Delbridge would have any of that, uh, that data. I'm sure we could uh, get something back to you expeditiously. I'd be hesitant to make a guesstimate off the, off the cuff. That's very fair, and I, I definitely would be interested to know how many of these calls are Medicaid calls, and then the, other, the second number, of course, is just the total number of calls as well, just to get a sense of what we're talking about. I really would appreciate that. Thank you. Sure thing. Thank you. And our final witness is Robert Phillips. 
Thank you, Madam Chairperson. My name is Robert Phillips. I am the chairman for the Northern State Farmers Association Legislative Committee. I just, and everybody has had all these things to say, so I'm not going to go into repeating those, but I do have one question or one statement because we're talking about trying to come up with some extra funds for these calls. The statement's this. In 1999, the average cost of a gallon of gasoline was $1.17. We all know what it is today. The second thing I have to say, it's very sad that we have to sit here and talk about money when it comes to this valuable service. But sadly, we have to talk about money to continue this valuable service. The Maryland State Farmers Association at this time does strongly support this bill and ask for a favorable vote on it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I see no hands. So that ends the testimony on this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. All right. We're going next to Senate Bill 166, Senator Ellis, Maryland Medical Assistance Program, doula program. Thank you, uh, Chair Kelly, Vice Chair Feldman, and members, distinguished members, colleagues of the Senate Finance Committee. Um, Arthur Ellis represented District 28, which is centered exclusively in Charles County. And I thank you for uh, the opportunity to present this bill. I have a, another uh, team member, Autumn Grant, who worked closely, closely with me on this bill. And I wondered if she could uh, co-present with me. Uh, we, we can't do that, Senator. We're going to need the senators to present. Okay, okay. Well, I'm ready to go with that. I also have a presentation to uh, um, uh, share. Thank you so much. So I just want to say this is my third year introducing Senate Bill, uh, which is now Senate Bill 166, uh, bringing the doula program under the auspices of Maryland Medical Assistance. I started out uh, uh, around three and a half, four years ago when I was invited to co-host a town hall with Senate, uh, well, actually U.S. House of Representative Majority Leader Steny Hoyer, who is my congressman from Legislative District uh, 5. And uh, this issue came up and it was brought to my attention, our attention, how the doula program was just a great results but they weren't getting paid. So we did some research and we found out uh, how we could basically pass a state law which authorized this to happen. And like I said, this is a third year introducing this bill. Last year, this bill passed through uh, uh, the uh, Finance Committee and it uh, passed the Senate uh, uh, unanimously and went over to the House and I do believe they ran out of time. So I thank you so much, uh, uh, Madam Chair, for this uh, very timely um, uh, bill hearing. Uh, next slide, please. You know, the Senate Bill uh, 166 of the doula program requires that Maryland Medical Assistance cover doula services uh, that are given. And could I just say that uh, over the summer, this past summer, uh, the administration, uh, we participate in a work group with the uh, Maryland Department of Health, and they love this uh, program so much that uh, Governor Hogan decided to fund this program throughout the state, uh, along with other maternal health initiatives to the tune of $70 million. And so what we did with this bill this year we incorporated uh, the uh, regulatory um, requirements from the Department of Health into this bill. And last year, uh, this bill uh, came to you as a pilot, but uh, Governor Hogan, the administration decided to uh, have this program statewide. And so I'm very happy to adjust this bill instead of a pilot, it will be a statewide bill. And you might ask, well, why do we need to pass this bill? Uh, since it's been implemented by the Hogan administration. Well, any action that's come under executive uh, authority, uh, the next chief executive, uh, we will have a new chief executive come next year, could just decide to end it. 
this is such a great program. We would um, not like that to happen. I spoke to Senate President Burke Ferguson. He said, yes, go ahead and introduce the bill. And uh, the Senate made it a uh, priority, a Senate priority. The Black Caucus uh, selected uh, this bill for a priority also uh, for us to um, uh, get through. I just also want to say that, uh, you know, uh, was it last year? Oh, time passed so, far, so fast. Uh, the Senate President's Work Group on Equity and Inclusion, which uh, I, was a, I was honored to serve on along with uh, Madam Chair and a few other members uh, in this committee, uh, we selected this. We studied this uh, issue, the doula program services, and made that a priority through the Senate work group on equity and inclusion. So a lot of support. Uh, we had some exciting um, uh, debates on the Senate floor last time, and uh, we educated everyone that this bill is strictly uh, there to help uh, moms and babies. babies. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, for those who might be tuned in and not uh, aware of this uh, from last year, I want to talk about a doula. Uh, so what is a doula? A uh, doula are trained non-medical professionals and they provide that emotional and uh, informational support to birthing parents through prenatal, labor and postpartum periods. Uh, doulas must be authorized by the, uh, this law and by the department to provide healthcare services. And so we have in this bill uh, who is authorized, what certification agencies are authorized to uh, uh, certify doulas. And we made sure that list of authorized uh, uh, association, doula associations is very diverse. So we have uh, doula associations, international, national, and we have uh, doula organizations that are ethnically based, uh, that are made up of African-American doulas. So if these folks are out there doing this tremendous service, they're training their doulas, they're members of these organizations that have been around for a while, uh, they will be authorized by this legislation to certify doulas. Next slide, please. So the services uh, doulas provide, I mentioned earlier, of course, uh, uh, childbirth to make sure that mom have healthy, very healthy babies and the mom has a really good outcome. And historically, let me say that uh, lower income moms, uh, especially African-American moms have a much more um, adverse outcome during childbirth uh, period. Uh, and so we uh, would love to have this bill to help them change those negative numbers around to make it a more positive experience. And could I just say that uh, several states uh, have decided to uh, implement this program. Uh, the one I can remember be sure about is New York. They decided to implement this. It was a pilot in New York and it went uh, around the state and I think last year. So, you know, this doula uh, services really help moms uh, during that uh, uh, childbirth period and before. And, you know, uh, coping skills for new parents, very important. Um, you know, uh, we want uh, new moms, new parents to understand how to, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> deal with those sleepless nights, right? Uh, new parents understand that your time is not your own when that baby arrives. That baby is hungry at 3 a.m. That baby uh, needs a diaper change at uh, 6 a.m. You know, parents have to be there with uh, calmness, with love. And so uh, doulas help uh, to train uh, those moms and teach them those skills. Support services, access to resources that improve birth-related outcomes, just tremendous services doulas offer. Could I just say that a lot of hospitals use doulas um, to help with troubled, uh, um, uh, potentially troublesome uh, delivery uh, of moms. And some hospitals uh, document the positive outcome these doulas uh, provide. And uh, have been, uh, so many of these hospitals are working with uh, doulas over the many years. And so, you know, great program, uh, great services uh, that are provided to uh, 
uh, moms. So we just want uh, lower income moms who need the Maryland Medical Assistance Program to be able to access these services. We don't want their access to financial uh, independent resources be a detriment to them having a tremendous better outcome when it comes to delivering a healthy, vibrant, vibrant baby and a healthy mom in the postpartum period. Um, next slide, please. So the benefits of having a doula, I've kind of covered that throughout the uh, uh, presentation, but of course, uh, shorter labor time, decreased anxiety or depression, uh, more pro positive experiences for moms. And of course, the mother-baby bonds, uh, when we decrease the stress on moms, uh, their uh, bonding um, strength increase with the baby, and that really helps uh, that child have a tremendous uh, positive start in life. Okay. And slide, please. Okay, so um, for your further reading, we have the uh, side of works there about the doula program. So with that said, I uh, conclude my presentation, Madam Chair and members of the committee, and I ask for a favorable report on Senate Bill 166. Thank you. You now go to Crystal Lepart. Um, good afternoon. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, um, for deferring. Um, my name is Crystal Lepart, and I serve as the advocacy co-lead for an organization called Black Girls Vote. Um, I just wanted to share a few reasons why we're favorable of the bill um, and happy to answer any questions towards the end. Um, so Black Girls Vote is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization committed to engaging, educating, and empowering Black women to activate their voice by using their vote. Um, again, I would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to share why this issue is so important to our organization. Um, overall, we have four pillars, and of course, one uh, main pillar is health health and wellness for Black women, especially young Black women. Um, and Black maternal health and wellness is one of those main advocacy focus areas. So according to the Center for Disease Control, Black women are disproportionately affected by maternal mortality. For every 100,000 live births, um, about 40 of the victims to pregnancy-related deaths are Black women. Um, and for context, that is three times more than the rate for white women. Um, also, the CDC determined that two thirds of those deaths are avoidable. Um, Black women are much more or less likely to receive um, prenatal care or any care within the first trimester of their um, pregnancy experiences, only following the experiences of Native women. Um, Black women are more likely to suffer from hypertension and preeclampsia, which increases the chances of um, terrible health outcomes for the mother and the baby. Um, so with that, uh, we know that the research supports that doula support, um, accessible um, and free doula support especially, um, helps with the outcomes for Black women and their children. Um, oftentimes, Black women's pain is not taken into proper consideration. Um, and doulas that have been working with the family and working with the expecting parent um, can help identify issues um, and make, you know determine the difference between standard pains and pains that need to be taken more consider consideration. Um, also, um, some parents may feel like that the main focus when they're going to the hospital or delivering a child is mainly focused on the health of the child. Um, and obviously that is very important and doulas can help with that. But doulas also have the training to make sure that parents are also experiencing the most comfort um, available in the process of becoming a new parent. Let, um, let me butt in. I'm not sure I said, but we do have two minutes for each uh, of the witnesses and you're about two and a half now, okay. Okay, sorry about that, I'll wrap. Um, so again, we support this bill and thank you so much for the invitation to um, talk specifically about the effects of doula support for black women. Thank you, are there any questions? Okay, we're going next to Kimberly Haven. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Kimberly Haven. I am here on behalf of Reproductive Justice Inside. We are a national organization that is concerned about the reproductive and sexual health care for incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women and girls. For the reasons, I'm so glad that I followed Crystal because now I don't have to say all the things that I was going to say. Um, but what I do want to say is that we have been working for the last several years to um, get doulas compensated for the tremendous service that they provide. 
side. We have been trying to work with more and more jewelers across the country um, to bring more attention to what we're trying to do here in Maryland. There is support for this bill. They are advocates, as Crystal said, when somebody goes to the hospital and they're in active labor to give birth, there's nobody there advocating for that parent. It's sure. all in that moment. And doulas serve such doulas serve such a critical. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Senator. Um, doulas serve such a critical um service to those individuals. They start with prenatal. They start with making sure that if they're going to have to be kinship care, that there's benefits that can be applied for, how to cope, as Senator Ellis showed in his slides, the birthing process, the what to expect when you're expecting. And when we're talking about um, uh, are most directly impacted by uh, by racism, by economics. These are individuals that, because of medical assistance, they can't access doula services. And yet, these are the very women and individuals and families that need this service the most, that can benefit this. We're all committed to good maternal health outcomes. We all want to see good birth outcomes, but that's for everybody. And medical assistance and having to rely on medical assistance for your health care should not be the barrier that you face to being able to have a healthy child. This is also about dignity. It is also about education. A lot of our communities don't know what to expect. Young girls do not know what to expect. They don't know how to cope. As Senator Ellis said, when that baby cries at three o'clock in the morning um, and you're frazzled, um, you know, those of us that have had children, we know what that feeling looks like. If we didn't have those coping mechanisms, a lot of communities don't. So for that reason, and the reasons that Crystal um, Leaphart suggested and or testified about, and Senator Ellis presented, and I'm sure there's other people behind me, we urge a favorable report of Senate Bill 166. Let's make sure that women have what they need to have good, healthy birth outcomes. Thank you. Senator Augustine has his hand up and then Senator Reedy. Thank you, Chair Kelly. Thank you, Senator Ellis, for sending this bill. And Senator, I wanted to give you the opportunity to respond. There is significant testimony that argues that this legislation is duplicative and, and that it doesn't really comport with the agreed upon regulatory structure that was worked on in the interim. And so I just want to give you the chance to respond to that because it, that's 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 in the testimony and, and a significant amount of the written testimony. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you for that uh, um, question, uh, Senator Augustine. So, so I brought this bill to this body, how should I say, uh, three years ago. I remember, you know, uh, Senator Keller said, hey, what's a dual? I haven't heard of that. And so we talked about it, it was an educational, uh, um, experience the first year. And I'm used to uh, basically uh, educating folks. Uh, my adult life, I was former professor at uh, University of District Columbia, uh, in Maryland Global Campus. And so we educated uh, the uh, committee and over the last uh, three years, uh, worked with this. You know, this is an issue which uh, I say I champion and work with the community groups to bring to the health department. We brought this to the health department. They worked on it. And they took the idea that we've worked on in this body and implemented it. So to say now that this bill does not comport with uh, what they have done, well, I mean, I can basically say let's uh, work. And if, we, if they have amendments to make it fit more uh, tightly with their regulation, um, I would have no objection to that. But uh, what the health department does, what the administration does, the executive branch does, is take our laws and implement them. But our laws should not reflect their regulations, 100%. You know, they write the regulations and they do the enforcement. So, you know, right here we can say, they're saying, that uh, they want the tail to wag this dog. But no, I reject that. Our purpose is to give them permission to continue to implement this beyond Governor Hogan's years. And so, you know, but we don't need to chase the regulations. 
uh, we want to, with this bill, authorize this program uh, to be, uh, to, be, to continue. And so the thing is, um, we'll work if there are changes the committee think will make the bill stronger. I definitely welcome them uh, because this thing, this bill, this dual bill is not about Ellis. It's about those moms out there who needs a lot of help, especially black mothers, black moms dying during the delivery. You heard the testimony from Ms. Haven and Ms. Uh, we don't want the answer to go too long. We've got another question. Okay. Then we okay. got seven additional bills to hear. We're okay, so uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm very passionate about this. And so let me stop there. I hope okay. I get your question, Senator Augustine. Yeah. Senator Reedy. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Senator Ellis, I, I, I appreciate your passion for wanting to help moms and um, and, and I, doulas, I have no objection to doulas and helping to make sure people have access to that kind of care. I do have the question about whether the bill now specifically excludes abortive services, and doula, like abortion doulas and doula abortion service. I know that issue's come up before. The, does the bill exclude that? Okay, uh, uh, great, Senator. Great, great question, Senator. And so we had that uh, question last year during the bill here on the Senate floor. And we had a little, uh, <laughs> little uh, wacky moment there. But you know, uh, we uh, this bill has nothing to do with abortion because what we talked about is in this bill is the <laughs> healthy pregnancy, healthy delivery, delivery. Okay, so right. absolutely nothing to do with abortion because we so want the babies. And so this bill, yeah, I agree. That's that great. Through. So birth, so basically, we this bill can be if we need to even we could clarify it's about birthing parents, um, uh, you know, and, and helping with with birth, correct? Well, that's exactly what the bill is, sir. Um, so uh, you maybe you know, we could talk offline about how to yeah, just sure. make it real clear. Sure, sure. I mean, working with the committee to um, uh, do what you think is necessary to get this uh, program to be funded permanently. Because I understand it's a huge issue, the needing for better, healthy birth rates, especially in the African American community. I totally understand, and uh, so I'd definitely love to talk with you more. Yeah, thank you, Senator. Okay, thank you very much, and that ends the hearing on that good bill. All right, we're going next to Senator Lamb, Senate Bill three hundred three, Public Health Non Consensual Condom Removal Prohibition. All right, thank you, uh, Chairman Kelly. Uh, glad to be here before the Senate Finance Committee for the record, Clarence Lamb, Senator in District 12. So um, Senate Bill 303 uh, is intended to establish a prohibition on non-consensual removal of a condom commonly known as stealthing. Stealthing is a form of sexual assault where an individual removes or tampers with a condom without the consent of the other individual. And its occurrence has been on the rise over the past few years. Senate Bill 303 adds um, a provision to the Health General Article to enable sexual assault victims and survivors agency and standing in pursuing injunctive relief and equitable damages. While there's less public awareness about this issue, stealthing is a form of sexual assault. It is a dis uh, empowering and demeaning violation of a sexual agreement between two otherwise consenting individuals. It's estimated that 5% of males and 19% of females aged 18 to 25 have been victims of non-consensual condom removal. In addition to exposing victims to sexually transmitted diseases, unwanted pregnancy, and other uh, unintended consequences, stealthing is also a traumatic experience that is associated with various aggregated mental and physical consequences over the course of a survivor's lifetime. California was the first state to pass a law creating civil penalties for stealthing, and a few other states have proposed similar bills, including New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, and Wisconsin. Additionally, um, the United Kingdom and Germany have also passed uh, bills uh, prohibiting stealthing. In line with California's initiative, this bill makes non-consensual condom removal a civil offense instead of a criminal offense. Uh, in criminal prosecution, the victims are less in control of the proceedings and there's a reliance on law enforcement and prosecutors to decide whether a case moves forward, which can be disempowering for the survivor. 
In contrast, uh, this legislation provides a civil violation standing where the, vic the survivor makes the decision about whether to file a lawsuit and the case focuses on supporting the survivor instead of punishing the perpetrator. Senate Bill 303, I believe, is an important step towards addressing uh, rape culture here in the state, as well as increasing protection for survivors of sexual assault, which disproportionately impacts oftentimes marginalized communities, um, as well as many women. With that, I would like to um, thank my sponsor panelists who are here to testify. We have Bianca uh, Bebe, as well as uh, Ro Bob Baziri and Eleanor Franklin. Franklin. Uh, I'd like to also thank the committee for your consideration and hand it over to members of the panel. Thank you. And we'll hear from your panelists in the order in which you named them. Each will have two minutes. Bianca Bibi. Good afternoon, members of the Finance Committee. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. My name is Bianca Beebe. I'm a public health researcher and policy fellow with Free State Justice, which advocates on behalf of low-income LGBTQ people in Maryland. And I'm here to offer my support for Senate Bill 303, which not only prohibits non-consensual condom removal, but also introduces the possibility of a victim filing a civil action for monetary compensation. Much like intimate partner violence and domestic sexual assault, a prohibition of non-consensual condom removal acknowledges that people deserve autonomy and protection, even for things that happen behind closed doors. Consent is always conditional, by which I mean that because someone has consented to a previous encounter or to certain sex acts does not mean that they automatically consent every time or to all things. Condoms are a cheap, highly effective, easily available method for preventing STIs in pregnancy. Although they're used by people in every demographic, they're especially important to people who don't have access to other forms of protection, such as young people, uninsured and low-income LGBTQ folks, and sex workers. Non-consensually removing a condom exposes the victim to a much higher likelihood of sexual health risks, which can have a devastating emotional and financial impact. I support SB 303 because instead of simply offering yet another purely carceral uh, intervention, it allows victims to seek monetary compensation for damages done to them. Although victims would still be able to pursue this matter criminally if they so chose, many victims of sexual violence do not want to do so because the process is too often re-traumatizing, alienating, and ineffective. Pursuing civil claims for compensation is a quicker and less arduous process for the victim and directly ties punishment to the harm committed. In essence, it respects victims' agency and gives them more choices about what justice looks like for them. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we're going next to Rohab Dozeri. Uh, thank you, Chair Kelly. Uh, Vice Chair Feldman and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify in support of Senate Bill 303. Uh, my name is Robob Viziri and I'm here on behalf of the Johns Hopkins Sexual Assault Resource Unit. Uh, Non-consensual condom removal, otherwise known as stealthing, has become increasingly prevalent in recent years due to its spread across internet communities and social media. As members of the Sexual Assault Resource Unit, we believe stealthing is a reprehensible act of sexual violence. Stealthing is a violation of a person's agency and it compromises one's right to make sexual decisions about one's own body. As condoms help prevent unplanned pregnancies, their non-consensual removal is a sign of disregard for the potentially devastating medical and financial burdens that come with bearing a child. Condoms also help prevent sexually transmitted diseases and their removal can increase a victim's risk of infection and death. Given that stealthing requires violating the terms of a sexual agreement, we at the Sexual Assault Resource Unit believe it is a form of rape. I want to thank the chairs again for the opportunity to testify on behalf of Senate Bill 303. This is a bill that can change the lives of survivors and its passage can be momentous for Maryland. I am happy to answer any questions and I urge a favorable report. Thank you very much for your testimony. All right, we're going next to Eleanor Frank. Uh, we're going, yeah, to let's see. Eleanor Franklin. 
Uh, thank you, Chair Kelly, Vice, Vice Chair Feldman, and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify in support of Senate Bill 303. I'm also here on behalf of the Johns Hopkins Sexual Assault Resource Unit. Uh, given the medical expenses and subsequently immense financial burden that can come with stealthing, it is imperative that survivors be given the opportunity to seek compensatory damages and injunctive relief against their attackers. Criminalizing stealthing does not afford these restorative options for survivors who never consented to such a financial burden and for which the perpetrator is completely responsible for incurring. Survivors who experience particularly severe trauma from a relationship in which stealthing and associated abuse may have been routine should be able to seek compensatory damages for mental health treatment. Moreover, stealthing is generally perpetrated by someone the victim has trusted to engage in sexual activity with who subsequently betrays this trust. It affects a victim for life and survivors endure immense suffering and devastation. So the possibility for civil action against a perpetrator is absolutely imperative. I want to thank the chairs again for the opportunity to testify on behalf of Senate Bill 303. I'm happy to answer any questions and I urge a favorable report. All right, Senator Feldman has a question. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. This would be for uh, Senator Lamb or any of the sponsor panel. I, uh, just on the issue of you know the, the remedies. So uh, you indicated, I, th I think you said California. What were some of the other states, and maybe this is you, Senator Lamb, what were some of the other states you said had, has already passed or have already passed similar uh, similar, similar uh, legislation? I think California was the only state that has passed it into statute. It's been proposed in New York, New Jersey, Wisconsin, and Massachusetts. So the question, I guess, because you know we're moving away from the idea of a criminal sanction uh, to a civil remedy, and I, you know, I, I am just sort of curious, this has nothing to do with the merits of the bill, but just in terms of a deterrent factor, you know, I would be curious to know, because you say that the criminal route is more onerous, but here you'd still be required to testify. I mean, you, you know, you have to come forward if you, you know, were the victim. It's, so I'm not sure if it's like materially different for the, for the victim to go the civil route and have to prove compensatory damages. But like in California, I don't know how long the law has been on the books, I just would be curious to know how many of the of suits like this in a state of 38 million people have actually been filed. You know, I mean, I would think, uh, give me an example, when you say compensatory damages, just give me a sort of just cliff notes, give me an example of what might be uh, some of the compensatory damages that you would see. Because the language in the bill is a little broader, it talks about other remedies that may be available beyond uh, other statutory, legal, or equi equitable remedies. What, what would some of those be? So I'm just trying to get my head around the, the damages and other remedies, and has this actually been utilized in uh, California? And if so, how often? Yeah, so I can I can start if other members of the panel want to chime in. Um, you know, that's uh, they, they're welcome to do so as well. So. Um, the, so it is a it's a fairly new part of the statute in California. I don't know how many of these have actually gone to have been pursued and gone to trial. Um, the uh, penalties could be, um, you know, remedies for consequences that might occur from from stealthing. So if somebody had to um, somebody had an unintended pregnancy, right? There are a lot of um, you know in unintended consequences that result from that, and potentially some compensatory. Um, need for the survivor. Um, there may be lesser needs um, as a result that fall short of, you know, unwanted pregnancy or unintended pregnancy. Um, uh, and those could be uh, compensated as well. The other piece of it that I think is, um, from our perspective, important here is that it's, at least from our reading of this, it's not clear whether this would um, be captured under sexual assault in the fourth degree. Um, and it's, it's, from our view, a legal gray area um, that the existing statute may not provide um, full uh, criminal uh, basis to be able to even pursue these types of cases. So this would at least give an opportunity for the survivors to have an outlet to pursue that. Yeah, I don't know if anybody else wants to weigh in because you, I, I mean, obviously this idea of an unintended pregnancy and then a compensatory damages would be, you know, a lifetime to pay for that. I mean, I'm, 
that's why I'm looking for some real world examples where this kind of a civil remedy was has actually been pursued in California, just so I, you know, I have an understanding of, I understand the intent and certainly I, I, I have no quarrel with what you're trying to achieve, but I, I, I'm just looking again at the remedies here and, the, and you know, what we're talking about. And, but I'll, I'll leave it there. I think I. I well, Mr. Vice Chair, we do have some time sure. and uh, you can continue to dialogue with the. Sponsor. No, 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 we're good. We're good. I'll, I'll yield yeah. unless somebody else wants to weigh in on. Okay. That. Well, we do have. Senator Kramer, and then we have another witness. Okay. Yeah, does that, did you just call on me? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I guess along similar lines to those of Senator Feldman's, um, you know, the compensatory damages and what, how that would change outcomes right now from what relief someone who is a victim might be able to achieve in the courts. And then I guess beyond that, <clears throat> exactly how would injunctive relief work after the fact? Uh, you know, so in other words, how are you relying on the court to step in and say, stop the practice after the, the fact? Can you just kind of give me a little bit of background there. Let me butt in and ask you a question. Um, I think you're asking some good questions. Uh, would it make sense if the sponsor is willing for two or three of our members and the sponsor to put together a work group to see if you could flush out more anything at all that you think uh, would assist? S Senator Feldman is more than welcome to do that, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, I'm happy to to He'd be ideal. Okay. Um, well, I'll tell you what. To, go ahead. Yeah, to to center uh, Kramer's point, and and I think Ms. Uh, Beebe has a question too, uh, or uh, answer to one of the questions. Um, the you know I think part of it is a it is very it's a very new part of the California statute. Um, and I'm happy to do some additional research to come up with and review any cases that might have been brought forward um, in California up to this point. I suspect it's probably too new that there's been much that's been brought forward. I think because of the fact that it's uh, in a gray area when it comes to the criminal part of the statute, whether this the circumstance like this could be applied to that, um, this are, offers a, another remedy for survivors of these types of instances, instances to be able to pursue that's clearer than uh, fourth degree sexual assault. Um, and it's intended really to serve as a deterrent. I don't um, foresee many of these cases being brought forward, um, but right now, because it's an illegal gray area, it doesn't, there's not much deterrent that exists in the current statute as it is. Well, perhaps, um... We might be enlightened by listening to our next witness, Lisa Jordan of the Maryland Coalition Against Sexual Assault in CASA. Uh, she's out of favorable with an amendment and maybe it's gonna help us some. Uh, Lisa, you've got two minutes now. Thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. I'm Lisa Jordan with the Maryland Coalition Against Sexual Assault. We all are supporting Senate Bill 303, but really only if amended. And, and that's really because of exactly the sorts of issues that are already being raised by your committee. It is 100% true that stealthing is something that should be dealt with. I, I will share with the committee that there are videos online about how to stealth effectively that are designed to encourage people to commit stealthing. This is something that is happening and it's happening both with sex workers, but also uh, with others in the community. So it is indeed a form of sexual assault. It is something that the committee should look at. The, the particular mechanism that is contained in Senate Bill 303 does give MCASA some concern. It gives me some concerns as a lawyer for some of the reasons that have already been brought forward. The California law was enacted on October 7th of 2021. It was effective January 1st of 2022. So I, I suspect that we'll not have a lot of information for us there. Um, I do think, however, that you could make out a tort of assault under current law. 
um, for the act of stealthing, kind of similar to some of the suits that are brought now for uh, SDI, STI transmission, those, those sorts of things. But this bill does add the availability of attorney's fees, which is really a, a huge benefit to those who are bringing forward these suits. I think MCASA's concern with that is that those attorney's fees are not available in a civil case for rape or for other for child sexual abuse or for other forms of sexual assault. So it's not so much that we're opposing that, but we think that if you're going to address that that needs to be a bigger, a bigger uh, project. Um, in terms of the actual damages, I do think it's going to be difficult and you might wanna consider liquidated damages if you really want to discourage this and have some sort of automatic uh, punitive issue. And in terms of actually um, being a softer or easier process than the criminal law, I, I would respectfully just remind the committee that there is no rape shield in civil cases. Um, and although we would hope that a judge would find prior sexual activities was irrelevant and inadmissible, that's that's certainly not a sure thing. So this, this does come forward. So it is, Madam Chair, as you suggest, something that is a little bit more complicated and perhaps would be better addressed um, by some, some further discussion. I, I would also just respectfully suggest, and I, I have to give credit to the Sexual Assault Coalition in California who provided me with this insight, that from, from their point of view, from MCASA's point of view, providing more public health education would actually perhaps be more effective than creating a new tort action. Um, and looking across the committee on the Zoom here, I see some of the shock and surprise as, as I describe the YouTube videos and things that, that teach people how to do stealthing. And I think, unfortunately, far too many people in the world also are unaware that this is a practice, that this is something that people are, are possibly going to do. And we really do need to raise awareness as part of our sexual assault prevention efforts. Under this administration, sexual assault prevention and education programs have been cut across the state of Maryland. So we really do need to tend to this in larger ways. And it would be really, I, I think, a very positive development if we increased sexual assault prevention and we also included stealthing as part of that. So I, I hope that's helpful to the, the committee. Certainly, I, I share the the, the desire to stop the practice of stealthing and MCASA very much appreciate Senator Lamb bringing this bill forward and bringing the issue forward. Would you be willing to share with the Senator and with the committee a written form of the um, actual amendment that you're proposing? You know, as Chair Kelly, I, I, that is usually my practice. This did seem to be such a large issue um, that it, it would take kind of a full scale development. So I'm I'm happy to work on that, but I, I would, yeah, I, I would be happy to work on that. Okay. Uh, if the sponsor were interested in there being a small work group, maybe with a couple of members of this committee, would you be willing to help? Absolutely. Okay. So we'll uh, let the sponsor decide how to take it from there. And thanks so very much to everybody who has testified on this very important issue that many of us were not even aware of. Senator Kramer. Yep, thanks, Madam Chair. I just wanted to give a shout out to Ms. Jordan. Um, we do not see Lisse here very often uh, in the Finance Committee, but back in my House Judiciary days, uh, she was a regular figure uh, testifying on issues in that committee, and her expertise and knowledge and understanding of these issues um, I think is exceedingly important and helpful in, uh, you know, in addressing how best uh, this very important issue uh, might be tackled. So uh, I would suggest leaning on her expertise would be most appropriate. Thank You're you. Too kind. Would, Thank you, so how, how helpful she was during the two years that I was vice chair in JPR. So, yeah. Okay. So I think we've got a plan possibly, uh, Mr. Chairman, if you want to take charge and tell us where you want us to go. All right. Okay, we're gonna move next to Senate Bill 330, Senator Reedy. And remember at this point, after this bill, we still have six others to go. Okay. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chairwoman Kelly, Vice Chair Feldman, and, and fellow members of the Finance Committee, I'm before you today to present Senate Bill 330, which is County Boards of Health and Baltimore City Health Department Procedures and Appeals Process. Um, we are coming out of, we all know what's been you know, the most difficult period in many ways our country's faced internally since World War II, I think. And uh, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, our small businesses, our sole proprietors, nonprofit organizations, churches have had to adjust constantly to changing health and safety protocols. Uh, there's discussion even, you know, we're still in that discussion now, even as our body has made changes. In addition to following the current laws and regulations that impact the work they were already doing that are already, you know, on the books, the primary entity responsible for enforcing these health and safety protocols, regulations, and laws, in most cases, is at the county level, and it's at our local health departments. In fact, during the pandemic, they actually were, they had expanded powers uh, during, the, uh, during the state of emergency. Um, and while the employees of our health department are state employees, they are funded by county governments, and the oversight mechanism over our health departments are the counties called, called boards of health, Baltimore City and the county's boards of health, which generally is the locally elected county council or commissioners in most cases. So it's kind of a hybrid setup in a way because it's a state agency trying to look at state law, but they're funded by the county and they are overseen by county boards of health. It's lent itself to a real lack of clarity um, from the perspective of job creators, small business operators, um, and also, as I mentioned, charities and other organizations, when they are cited or notified of an issue by their local health officer or the, the staff from the health department. And this is not just a COVID-related issue. I mentioned COVID to start because obviously it's, it's come into the, really to the forefront of people's minds more and more because they're interfacing with health departments more and more. Uh, but this has been an issue even before we had COVID. It's been unclear. Some of the, the structure has been unclear in law, and it's caused conflict for years. I can tell you it's been a source of consternation for, for businesses and charities and other organizations. But as an elected official has tries to advocate for, for my constituents, and I've heard from many other elected officials, it, it can be very frustrating just figuring out what happens when a, when when the county board of he, when a, when a county uh, health officer or a county uh, health department makes a ruling or a citation, and if it's not clear maybe in law or we're not sure where it's coming from, what's the chain of command? How do we how do we evaluate and look look at the issue? So Senate Bill three thirty seeks to bring clarity to county board of health orders and county health department orders, so the taxpayers can understand the chain of command and uh, have a clear appeals process to allow a person or business the option of presenting their situation to their county board of health or the city board of health when there is a dispute. Now we know, uh, and I know in presenting this bill, this is not an attempt in my view to malign the people working in our health departments. We know that they've been under a tremendous amount of pressure and strain, um, but and we, and we, we wanna respect that. And we also wanna say, we, we want them to have more clarity too. So that they're not feeling like they have to over enforce uh, to try to cover, you know, sort of cover themselves, but also so that there's an opportunity for people to understand that chain of command. We've seen repeated conflicts arise in my district and around the state because orders from health departments were either unclear or seem random or sudden and give no option for any sort of debate or negotiation or discussion. Now, if, if, if the health department's found some sort of real violation in regards to food preparation, we want them to take quick action, but there are times when it's not quite that clear. It's not that cut and dry. You know, interesting, I had a constituent that um, was doing a small little agricultural, um, had a little bit of property that had an agricultural practice on it, literally growing lavender. And um, they had put a porta potty out uh, for people to use, but it was a little, they only had a few people stopping by every so often. But they got, the health department got called by a neighbor. It was zoned properly. They were in the right thing. The health department comes out and says, well, you can't have that porta potty here. And then they said, well, where is that in the law or the code? Well, the health department, it's silent. It's silent on that. So they go back and forth and say, well, if it's silent, why can I not have it? So then the health department comes back and says, this is just one specific example. It's a microcosm of what we deal with. Health department comes back and says, well, if you get it cleaned regularly, you can have it. But it's still not in the law. It's still not in the code. So things like that cause consternation and confusion. And that was something that sort of was accommodated. But We've had a lot of issues that I've dealt with myself that many people I know that serve as state legislators and around the, the state have dealt with. 
where it's not clear who who sets the final authority, especially when it's not in law. Um, and I think you all probably on this call on this Zoom call can think about cases that you've heard, whether it's a, a fire department carnival or a bake sale at a church where health department's coming in uh, to to shut it down or to make some sort of requirement. And it, it just doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make common sense. So there's there's some issues that Senate Bill 330 would address. Uh, one is that it would require every county board of health to establish clear and understandable requirements when and under what circumstances the health officer of their county or, or the staff, the county, uh, the health officer or their staff may perform an inspection, issue a citation or issue an order to cease operation. Now, in some areas, there's state law that governs that, but there's a lot of areas where there is no clear guidance in Comar state law that health departments still have uh, oversight over. So this also, Senate Bill 330 would also require that citations or orders to cease operations reference the specific law, policy, or regulation that has been violated, and a summary of options for appealing that is provided. And then third, it would require each county board of health, and this is the elected bodies of the county, uh, to establish a process by which a person may appeal a decision of the health officer or staff, and they should make a determination on that appeal in a reasonable amount of time. We're not being prescriptive in saying every county has to do it exactly the same way. We want an appeals process that's clear in law so that it, it really makes sure everybody understands the alignment and the structure of chain of command uh, in our counties and in our state as it relates to health departments and orders that they have. And the, um, you know, the last item in the bill uh, makes it clear to just to eliminate any issue of confusion, makes it clear that if there's a conflict between a decision by the health department and the policy of the county's board of health within the county's jurisdiction, the, the decision of the county board of health will have the final say. And right, near, right now, that is not clear in state law. Uh, whenever I've talked to the state health department about a, a conflict like this, they've said, well, it's up to the county board of health. But then, uh, it, you know, it, it isn't in state law very clearly that that's the case. So Senate Bill 330 seeks to bring needed clarity, order, and greater transparency to the operations of our health departments and how they interface with our county governments and our constituents. And it ensures that the oversight structure is clear in the law and clear to the public. I appreciate your attention and I do uh, welcome any questions. I would ask for your favorable support and I'm willing to work on this legislation to try to make sure that we can, we can make this very clear in state law. So thank you. Thank you. Our next um, speaker is Dominique. Butchko, Maryland Association of Counties, Mako. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Happy to speak and be speaking before you again. Uh, Dominic Butchko, Maryland Association of Counties. Mako asked the committee to give SB 330 an unfavorable report. Um, each county's board of health has decision-making authority spelled out in state law. The structures of the board of health largely vary um, depending on jurisdiction, and that's up to local discretion. Um, different constitutions of these bodies underscore the need for locally established procedures. Uh, SB 330, contrary to what you heard right now, would impose a uniform statewide rule that may be intended to deal with concerns in one jurisdiction, but will prove an improper fit for other jurisdictions. The citation and appeals pro procedures are both subject to local scrutiny. Both boards of health and local governing bodies may tailor these procedures to respond to local concerns. The reforms in SB 330 would prove redundant and inefficient for both the department and affected businesses and individuals. In short, local leaders are best equipped to guide the processes and operations of their local health departments and accordingly make a request an unfavorable report on SB 330. Okay, and I should note that the Maryland Department of Health has sent in written testimony unfavorable as has the mayor's office of government relations from Baltimore City. Okay, that ends the testimony. Senator okay, Senator Reedy. I just have one quick follow-up question for uh, Mr. Butchko. So I, I'm hearing what you're saying. So mm -hmm. what is the appeals process right now? Is there an appeals process in most counties where I can appeal if I'm, if I'm a business owner in Baltimore City or in Arundel County? and the health department comes in and says, you're shut down because you have the freezer in the wrong place in your store. What, what's, my, what's my recourse if I disagree with that ruling and can feel I can show that that's not correct? So it's specific to each county. Each county sets their own uh, appeals process. 
but you would you mind would you mind maybe offline? I'd love to know if you could find some examples of the appeals process. Um, yeah, I would. I could definitely follow up on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you. All right, we're going next to Senate Bill Forty Three, Senator Feldman, and um, Senator. Okay, all right. Why don't you go ahead? Okay, okay. thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I, I don't recall the last time I had a bill where I didn't have my own panel, but this is. Uh, I think we may have one or two witnesses signed up, but uh, I don't think this is a bill that requires witnesses. It's a very simple bill. So obviously, you know, we've learned a lot over the last couple of years, um, and it's been pretty clear, I think, the last two years during the pandemic that it's pretty important that we have strong science-based advisors at the highest level of government, and that's a critical, critical component um, in successfully addressing any public health crisis. And so there was a piece last week in the Daily Record talking about this bill in the House hearing. And I was surprised, actually, as a result of putting in the bill to learn a couple things about. And it was just mentioned by a Senator Reedy Komar and our local health officers. So right now, I did not realize, and many of you may not realize, that at the local level, all of our local health officers under Maryland law and Maryland regulations are required to be an MD. They are required to be a medical doctor. By contrast, we have absolutely no qualifications in state law at all for our Secretary of Health, who's the top officer in the state, an $18 billion budget, a third of all the spending in the state, includes oversight of our Public Health Administration, Behavioral Health Administration, DDA, Medicaid, local health departments, the Office of Health Care Quality, and on and on and on. So I took a look beyond the fact that we have this discrepancy between what we require of our local health officers and the fact we have nothing on the books for our Secretary of Health. I looked. I took a look at all other states and you've got a document that was delivered to uh, your office uh, this morning because it was past the deadline to uh, put it in into the system that lays out the qualification requirements for Secretaries of Health in all of the other states in the United States, Democrat and Republican alike. And so let me say at the outset, I don't think you need an MD necessarily to be Secretary of Health. There are a lot of other important qualities you would wanna have, management experience and things like that. Um, so I get that, although I would note six states in our country actually do require that the Secretary of Health be an MD, but I'm not, we're not going that, that far in this bill. Um, but I, but I also, uh, and also, by the way, it would limit our applicant uh, pool, uh, pool of applicants who may want to be secretary uh, too narrowly. But they should have some, some basic minimal background in the health arena. So uh, Senate Bill 243 is a very simple bill. All it says is it requires the Secretary of Health must be professionally qualified through either experience or education in, in one of five basic areas. So this is not a high th a threshold. And the five areas are either health law or policy, healthcare facilitate, uh, facilities administration, health economic or financial management, government operations related to healthcare or a healthcare provider. So those are a list of five. And to be secretary under this bill, all you need to do is meet one, just one. Um, the bill aligns Maryland with 20 other states and if you look at the list that I did provide the committee, who have similar qualifications in place. And these are red and blue states alike, ranging from Kentucky, Florida, West Virginia, all the way to California, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Virginia, to name a few blue states, red states, urban, rural. 20 states have uh, some basic qualifications requirements. Um, and this does not change the appointment process. The bill only kicks in July 1st. It will have uh, no impact on our current Secretary of Health. Um, I would note that the current Secretary would meet one of those five criteria, I've been told. Specifically, he has some experience in the healthcare field. It may have been a while ago, but so it has no impact on our current Secretary. It puts in place a very, very modest requirement level, unlike what we do for local health officers requiring uh, that they have an MD. Um, and finally, Madam Chair, Senator Lamb had a bill similar to this back in 2018 in the House, and I did chat with him, and he did have some thoughts and has um, submitted an amendment to the, to the committee 
uh, that he believes, and I think he has as well, and I think is a pretty good idea uh, to make the bill even a bit stronger by extending the rationale here to some of the various deputy secretaries of health. Um, specifically, we have five deputy secretaries of health that have jurisdiction over five very specific subject areas. And what uh, the Lamb Amendment uh, suggests is that it would require that the deputies, these five deputies have at least five years of experience in the field that they are responsible for. And the deputy secretary for public health must be a licensed healthcare practitioner. So I think that amendment uh, makes some sense, but I'll, I'll let the, the, um, you know, the committee think about that. That amendment should be in the position, the possession of the committee and in your offices. Uh, but at a bare minimum, uh, I would ask for a fable on 243 about the secretary of health, and we can obviously have a discussion. We get uh, near the uh, voting uh, session on, um, on this issue of extending some of these requirements down to the deputies. So uh, Madam Chair, that's basically what Senate Bill 243 does. And I certainly, I don't have any witnesses with me, but I'd, I'd be happy okay. to answer questions. Thank you. There are, and I'll go to Senator Hirsch in a minute. There are two um, they, they didn't significant pieces of written testimony, uh, one from the Maryland Legislative Coalition and one from the Mental Health Association of Maryland, both in favor of the bill. Uh, Senator Hershey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick question for the bill sponsor. Um, and I, I don't mean this as a joke, but I do want to, to ask the question. Would a, a member of the Senate Finance Committee or, or House Government Operations Committee qualify under the first criteria, um, professionally qualified through experience or education in health law or policy? I see Chair Kelly uh, nodding her, her head no. Well, you know, I would answer this, Senator Hershey. You know, we have, um, I think we even had some conversation. You know, when we have these requirements for everything from board members, we had this discussion on the floor today, the language is not precise. This is subject to later interpretation. And obviously, uh, you know, executive noms would raise this issue. I, you know, I don't think we can be so precise as to, this is pretty general language, you know, either executive noms or the Senate when we're confirming these folks would believe that they come under these this qualification. I'm sure that would be the subject of some debate if somebody from the finance committee showed up. Maybe you could have lawsuits. If somebody's appointed, somebody could say they don't qualify under state law and a court would ultimately decide. So I don't have a tight answer. I don't think we need to have a tight answer. This, like any number of things in our law, are, are, are some guidelines and some requirements. I would only say that this is mirrors language in uh, 20 other states. And I'm not, don't believe that this has been a, a source. It's giving the, uh, I would say the governor in this case, some parameters. In other words, if you're gonna appoint a secretary of health, we're telling you, at least the policymakers in the general assembly are saying to you, um, send us somebody, uh, if you want us to confirm that has some basic background in healthcare, a policy uh, or one of these five criteria. So I think this is right, but for, for the governor. Now, again, I think that's probably the best way to answer it. But if you wanted to, you know, clarify it in some way, shape, or form, I'm open to just see. just interesting. I mean, we see a number. Well, of well I, I didn't call on anybody else. You didn't put your hand back up, and we do have six other bills. Can you guys carry on the colloquy elsewhere? Okay. No, I, I, I would appreciate it since you didn't put your hand on. <laughs> Thanks so much. Okay, uh, let's move on, uh, Senator Feldman, to Senate Bill 244. Madam Chair, were there, you said that there were a couple witnesses or, or not? They, they aren't, they didn't show. And there oh, were. Oh, gotcha. Okay. And that's why sure. I mentioned there was written testimony, and I okay, told gotcha. you from that okay. uh, uh, was supportive of your bill. Okay. Okay. So we're on right. 244, 244. Madam Chair? Okay. Um, so this is an important health issue as well. I, I think um, nationally, here's some statistics. One in three Americans suffer from high blood pressure, which increases, uh, as I'm sure everybody knows, the risk of heart disease and stroke, which are the leading causes of death for Maryland residents, not to mention uh, the economic healthcare costs and the like for our healthcare system and our state budget. A closer home here in Maryland, 
around 1.5 million adult Maryland residents have high blood pressure, 1.5 million adult Marylanders. An estimated 700,000 of those 1.4 million Marylanders uh, have hypertension, do not have their high blood pressure under control at all, which again puts them at increased risk of many serious health conditions beyond heart disease and stroke, vision loss, kidney damage, and the like. Uh, hypertension, I, I think a lot of, we've always heard is often ta- uh, thought of as the silent killer because people with the condition often don't have any signs or symptoms. One in five people with hypertension are completely unaware of their condition. So to increase awareness and be able to take steps to control the condition, people at risk need to have their blood pressure checked regularly. And you'll see some of the testimony from MedCi, a slew of other uh, letters of support for this bill. So the bottom line is, and the research is clear, that having self-measured blood pressure devices is the key. Obviously, that helps improve patient knowledge, which in turn is the key to getting the medication uh, that you need and ultimately effectively reducing hypertension. So all Senate Bill 244 does is the bill requires Medicaid to provide coverage for self-measured blood pressure monitoring Uh, for all Medicaid uh, recipients diagnosed with uncontrolled uh, high blood pressure. Uh, That's all the bill does, takes effect January 1, 2023, and the coverage will include the monitors and reimbursement to healthcare providers for patient training. Now the fiscal note uh, says expenditures would increase $1.4 million. Um, I I would only make this point, that is absolutely not taking into account um, the, you know, basically, the outcome is to try to get healthcare policy in place to help individuals stay healthy, and it doesn't reflect any any potential savings uh, that would result for Medicaid enrollees uh, improving control of their uh, high blood pressure. So, yes, there's a fiscal note, but you have to uh, offset that against the benefits uh, that would inure uh, with these devices in place. So that's essentially what the bill does, uh, would require coverage for those devices. Medicaid uh, recipients who've been diagnosed with uncontrolled blood pressure. Okay, very good. Let's uh, go to Senator Klossmeyer who has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, Senator Feldman, uh, well, a friend of mine has uncontrollable blood pressure and she has to take her blood pressure every day, but it's hooked onto a device that's hooked into her doctor. It's a special phone that she has to, to do. Do you, are you aware of anything like that? I, I, you know, that would be for our, you know, we've got testimony. I think I would have to defer to maybe MedCi or some, okay. I just beyond my realm of expertise. Yeah, because I, I just was surprised when she says I have to take it every day, but they, they, they monitor her, the doctor actually monitors her. And I don't know if it's a business that, the doctor works from or whatever, so. They do have a lot of professionals signed up to test. Okay, well, maybe MedCog can answer that or someone can. Thank you. Okay, we're going next to Laura Hale, American Heart Association. Thank you, Chair Kelly. And thank you, uh, uh, Senator Feldman. And thank you all members of the committee for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Laura Hale. I'm the Director of Government Relations for the American Heart Association, and we seek in strong support of this legislation. Um, As Senator Feldman laid out, this bill does a a wonderful job of making sure that uh, Maryland Medicaid patients will be taken care of with their high blood pressure, both by having clinician support and also by being able to monitor their blood pressure at home. Research has shown that this is extremely effective at lowering people's high blood pressure, also known as hypertension. Um, We know that that means less trips to the hospital. That means longer, healthier lives. That leads that means savings in cost of medication and other high bills, such as going to the hospital, which ultimately will meet, lead to cost savings. And so although you see in the fiscal note, the number, um, the 1.4 million, we will note that there are a lot of cost savings that come for this for Medicaid. Um, we also would just like to note as well 
Um, when we think about who all will this be helping, there are a lot of people who deal with high blood pressure um, and a variety of patient populations, but I would like to speak to one personally of looking at those who have recently given birth and are postpartum mothers. Um, I'll speak personally of my own experience. I wouldn't be before you all today if I didn't have um, blood pressure monitoring after I had my daughter back in August of 2020, I developed preeclampsia postpartum. And it was because of the ability of, you know, I was able to get good support. And I want that for all of our Medicaid patients is to be able to have that support. Um, and I was able to get my blood pressure back under control and be with you all now. I would have been a statistic otherwise. And so it's really important to me and to the American Heart Association writ large to make sure that we see this pass so that all of our uh, Medicaid patients have the opportunity for longer and healthier lives. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're going next to Seth Martin of Johns Hopkins Medicine. Thank you so much, Chair Kelly, Vice Chair Feldman, and the, the members of the Finance Committee. So I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. I am a cardiologist and board member for the American Heart Association, and am here to also extend my strong support for Senate Bill 244. Uh, I'll try to just add to what's already been said. Uh, you know, it's already been stated that hypertension is a silent killer and far too many of our patients, particularly the Medicaid population, struggles to control their blood pressure. And from my years of clinical practice, and this is supported by the, the literature, that patients who are able to have blood home blood pressure monitoring devices, and there are a number of, of systems out there that, as, as was being stated, that can connect those blood pressure values to a doctor's office. Um, there, there's really an amazing number of, of kind of um, companies and systems that facilitate that. So it will be specific to a hospital or practice, which of those systems is used. But um, by, by enabling those types of re remote patient monitoring with a home blood pressure monitor, it really does then allow patients to get their blood pressure under control. And, you know, the, uh, Laura spoke of you know, becoming a statistic, I, you know, to share a, a, a very concise story, I just had a colleague, Dr. Avon Commodore Mensa, who's running a blood pressure study in uh, Baltimore area. And one of the participants in that study was found to have a, a really dangerously high blood pressure of over 200. This is a considered an emergency where you, you know, there's a high, high risk of stroke or other cardiovascular events. And this was just detected because he was part of her study. And he, um, he unfortunately was too worried even just to go in to seek, um, given his lack of insurance and so forth. And hopefully he will be on Medicaid very soon, but due to the lack of insurance and the lack of a home monitor, he was unaware of how dangerously high his blood pressure was. And he also, it's also a, a challenge for someone like this just to get in for, for medical visits and so forth. So he's, He's someone who hopefully will get on Medicaid and will benefit from this type of program. But unfortunately, there's many people out there just unaware of how uncontrolled their blood pressure is. So as a physician, um, I am pulled in many different directions every day. And, um, and I think another part of this bill is being able to catalog the time spent educating patients, supporting them in their blood pressure management. And so the, the new codes offered in this legislation will, will really be helpful from a physician perspective. So for all these reasons, I urge a favorable report on Senate Bill 244, and I thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Now we have um, written testimony from a number of entities. Uh, Robin Elliott, several organizations, including Movable Feast. We've got a Annie Cobble of Johns Hopkins, Maryland Department of Health, the Office of Government Relations, Maryland Department of Health, again, Office of Government Relations, and their Health and Wellness Council, MedCAI, uh, Pam Casemeyer, and um, the Nurse Practitioners Association of Maryland, all with written testimony in support of the bill, as well as Brian Frazee, Maryland Hospital Association. There is no uh, opposition at all to this bill. Thank you. All right, we're going next to 
282, Senator Augustine Work Group on Screening Related to Adverse Childhood Experiences. And we'll start with you and then your various witnesses who, are, who signed up for oral testimony will have two minutes each. Thank you, Chair Kelly and members of the committee. Senator Malcolm Augustine here to talk about Senate Bill 282, which establishes a work group on screening related to adverse childhood experiences. The Maryland Department of Health must provide staff for the work group. The work group must submit a report, its findings, recommendations around screening uh, for patient specific protocols, including within the Youth Behavior Risk Survey, um, utilizing public health action to the governor uh, and the General Assembly um, with a report. And we also um, are obviously thankful for uh, what we did as a body last year um, with regard to the trauma-informed care, uh, and this is supportive of that. But more, pl more plainly, um, colleagues, the intent of this bill is just to break the intergenerational trend of adverse childhood experiences um, that are handed down from generation to generation, including myself. Um, you know, I, I remember when we were contemplating raising our kids, my wife and I, um, and, you know, like many of us, you, I'm sure many of you too, you were likely spanked or something like that when you were growing up. And so we, we decided that we were going to, uh, you know, we, we were, I mean, it's all that I knew is what we did. And, and so my oldest, we, we spanked our oldest um, when she was, was small. And then there came a day when I saw her spanking her doll and a light bulb just went off for me when I saw my child spanking her doll and um, how that was the last time we ever spanked her again or participated in that. This was a, a time when we were transferring this intergenerational um, trauma over from what we experienced over to the next generation of my family. We wanna break that. And that's really what's at the heart of what this is for me. Adverse childhood experiences are those traumatic events that occur in childhood. Um, they may be violence, abuse, growing up in a family with mental health or substance use problems. And that toxic stress that comes from those ACEs changes brain development and it affects the body. Um, those stresses do that. It's, it, this is an actual change to the chemistry of the brain um, that is linked to chronic health problems, mental illness, substance misuses in adults. These neurological impacts of ACEs, though, can be treated. Uh, for example, there are positive childhood experiences that can counteract the neurotoxicity associated with ACEs. And preventing ACEs could reduce a large number of health conditions. CDC estimates um, say that 21 million cases of depression um, could be impacted, 1.9 million cases of heart disease, uh, and significant cases of obesity, 2.5 million. Now, we've adopted public health uh, data legislation um, a piece of which you will hear from me later on in session, longitudinal data to help us to measure how we're doing on mitigating ACEs. Um, and I support that. And, but this is about clinical intervention to help our kids today. Um, but I will share with you all that there is not agreement among stakeholders on addressing clinical intervention. And so I support you know, trauma-informed care and I'm honored to sit on our trauma-informed care commission as our, our Senate representative. Uh, I readily admit um, the bill needs some work, um, but the intent is to start that process of reaching kids and preventing ACEs for better health outcomes. So I ask colleagues to provide a favorable report on Senate Bill 425. Thank you. Sorry about that. Any. 282. Okay, 282. All right. Uh, we're going next to Nicholas Malucci. Good afternoon, Chair Kelly, uh, Vice Chair Feldman, and the members of the committee. My name is Nick Malucci. I'm a fourth year medical student at Michigan State University, as well as a Master of Public Health student at Johns Hopkins. And I'm here to ask you to give a favorable report to Senate Bill 282. During my third year of medical school, I had the opportunity to treat patients in the emergency department. I was working at a hospital in Detroit that often treats victims of gun violence, domestic abuse, substance abuse, etc. Unfortunately, I had the misfortune of treating many children who are victims of violence. One story remains in my head. A teenage patient was brought into the emergency department via ambulance after being shot in the arm and shoulder. Luckily, he did not sustain any life-threatening injuries. I walked into his patient room and talked with him about what had happened. 
He seemed unfazed as I washed out the bullet wounds with saline solution. I could not tell if he was numb to the violence he had experienced or if this was a normal part of his life he had witnessed from an early age. Questions flooded in my mind. I thought to when I was his age, what I was doing as a teenager. I thought about how he got to this point, what had happened in his life to desensitize him to this violence. I thought about the intergenerational trauma he may have been subjected to due to the perpetuation of violence in the community. Finally, I thought about the children, children who were lost in the community and what their lives could have been. A lawyer, a teacher, a legislator. This event and many others has me determined to create change. I believe SB 282 will establish a group of passionate individuals um, looking to reduce adverse childhood experiences in Maryland and create a brighter future for Maryland's youth. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, there are several pieces of written um, information. I mean, a lot of it from Casa Permanente to the Maryland Psychological Association, Network Against Domestic Violence, Maryland State Education Association, all in support of this bill. Just a lot of written testimony. So if you say you wanted to work on it some more, I think there are a lot of people who probably want to help you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right, we're going next to Senator Augustine's uh, 323, Maryland Medical Assistance Program Prior Authorization for Drug Products in Treatment, in Treatment uh, Opioid Use Disorders Prohibition. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senate Bill 323 um, really looks to prohibit uh, Medicaid from applying a prior authorization for these specific prescription drugs, which are used for the treatment of opioid use disorder um, that contain methadone, um, bipronophen, or naltrexone. And forgive me for the lack of pronunciation on that. In Maryland, the number of opioid related deaths increased by 20% between 2019 and 2020. And preliminary data indicates a continued increase in 2021, driven substantially by an increase in opioid-related fatalities among African-American Marylanders. Now, research shows that a combination of medication and therapy can successfully treat opioid use disorders, and medication for opioid use disorders can help sustain recovery. It's also used to prevent or reduce opioid overdose. Medicaid for opioid use disorders is effective and improves mortality, treatment retention, and remission, but most people with OUD remain untreated. There are three medications of which I mentioned before that are approved by the FDA for use for this treatment uh, of opioid use disorders. Now, currently Medicaid um, Pharmaceutical and Therapeutic Community uh, Committee annually reviews the class of uh, opioid use disorder medications. Currently the brand name um, buprenorphine products do not require prior authorizations. That list is reviewed every year. And in 2016, one of those brands um, was actually removed from the pre, uh, preferred drug list for non-clinical reasons. Now, the result of that is that consumers have to wait longer to access their medication. In some cases, uh, having medications changed to avoid that wait. This caused unnecessary disruption in service um, for uh, our very vulnerable population of people. Now, passing this legislation will ensure that consumers and providers will not have to be concerned about a similar change every year. They will also have more choices when it comes to medication that works best for them. This, this legislation is already in place in places like Illinois, Kentucky, New York, and Texas, to name a few. Now, colleagues, this is a matter of healthcare, healthcare equity. In 2017, this Maryland General Assembly passed legislation which prohibits prior authorization for these um, opioid use disorder medications in commercial insurance plans. The carrier supported that measure wholeheartedly, along with providers and the recovery community. People enrolled in Maryland's uh, public insurance program should have the exact same access. Colleagues, with this in mind, I ask for a favorable committee report on Senate Bill 323. Thank you. All right, we'll go next to Ann Seacott. She's not in the meeting. His panel, none of his panels in the oh, meeting. Oh, you know what? Uh, your, your, the panel that was listed, they're not in the meeting. But I do, all right, I'm gonna um, go to Vicki uh, Walters. And you do have tons of people signed up all in favor with written testimony, but uh, okay, so Vicki Walters. 
Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Vicki Walters and I manage an opioid treatment program located in Baltimore City. And I'm here today to urge you to give a favorable report on Senate Bill 323. As a provider, I can tell you that we need the least restrictive measures for people who are accessing treatment for their opioid use disorder. A prior authorization can add hours and sometimes days to the admission process while people are dying on the streets every day. When they walk in our door, we need to be able to work with patients immediately to begin the medical stabilization process, which includes medications used to treat the opioid use disorder. Many of us remember 2016 when a change was made to the medications used for opioid use disorder on Medicaid's preferred drug list. In my, in my clinic, this led to many patients relapsing when they had to switch medications. Um, and with fentanyl out there on the streets, we cannot afford to do this again. The stakes are just too high. In 2017, prior authorizations in the commercial in insurance market were done away with. And I urge you to do the right thing and make it easy and pain and as painless as possible for those on Medicaid who need these critical medications. Um, and, you know, frankly, providers, we don't need another step. We're stretched to our limits in the field right now due to severe staffing shortage and shortages and the pandemic burnout. For these reasons, I urge a favor favorable report on Senate Bill 323. And I thank you for your time today. Thank you. And now Ann Seacott has joined the meeting and is testifying next. You have two minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Ann Seacott on behalf of NCADD Maryland, the National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence. I apologize for the technical uh, difficulties. Um, NCADD um, strongly supports this uh, piece of legislation. Amid the COVID-19 pandemic, the pre-existing opioid overdose death crisis has worsened. In Maryland, the number of opioid-related deaths increased by 20% between 2019 and 2020, and the preliminary data indicates a slower but still increasing number uh, of, of deaths in 2021. The intent of this bill, as the sponsor said, is to bring equity to low-income Marylanders who are enrolled in Medicaid. Some of you remember as again, as the sponsor mentioned, um, you all did this for people with private insurance in 2017. And now we're looking to ensure that people with public insurance also have um, the same access. I wanna be clear, the bill applies to medications used in the treatment of opioid use disorders, not for uh, the prescription of, of opioid for, excuse me, for treating pain. Removing prior authorizations will allow people to receive medication deemed to be medically necessary by licensed healthcare practitioners. Currently, Medicaid's Pharmaceuticals and Therapeutics Committee annually reviews this list and all classes of drugs and decides which ones get put on the preferred drug list and which ones will require a prior authorization. As the previous witness mentioned, um, that those changes can be very disruptive to care. Um, and we think that this bill is an important policy statement. Uh, we believe that it says that given the overdose death crisis in Maryland, we need consumers to have immediate access to these medications uh, for their addictions. So we urge a favorable report. Um, and, and I had gotten a note also while I was in the waiting room uh, that, that Nancy Turner, one of the witnesses, um, had to perhaps leave to get to an appointment. Um, and so if, if she is not here, I would just like to make sure folks uh, know that um, she's the uh, executive director of Serenity Health, which provides services in Harford and Cecil counties. Um, and she too wanted to uh, speak to the need to make sure that people have access to the medications as soon as they need it. Thank you. And now Ramsey Farah has entered the room uh, from Phoenix Health Center. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair uh, uh, Kelly and uh, members of the committee. Thank you. Uh, I'm Joy Ramsey Farrar, American Board of Addiction Medicine certified and distinguished fellow of the American Society of Addiction Medicine. I have treated over 7,500 patients with substance use and opioid use disorder in Hagerstown, Maryland. One of the most challenging barriers to access and the optimization of the delivery of care to our patients has been prior authorization. The time, staffing, cost, and the frustration of experiencing patients suffering 
while we await the practically inevitable blessing to medicate our patients is a sad state of affairs. Patients walking out to use, looking us in the eyes while we are trying to explain why they cannot yet get their medication that they desperately need is unconscionable. We all know the statistics of death from overdose and the relented scourge that this epidemic, well over 2,000 Maryland in one year, died. Yeah, Having this obsolete yeah. requirement of prior off to adequately manage our patients is a cynical slap to the face of common sense. I thank the General Assembly for passing legislation seven years ago to prohibit prior authorizations in the commercial insurance market. I ask you to do the same in Medicaid. Thank you for allowing me to share with you what we face every day. Thank you very much. We're going next to Emily Allen. You have two minutes. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Emily Allen. I'm the public policy associate at the Mental Health uh, Association of Maryland here in support of SB 323. Uh, most of what I've said or what I was going to say has already been said, so I'm just going to keep it brief. Um, Anne had talked about this a few moments ago, but there were 2,518 opioid-related fatal overdoses in 2020. In the first half of 2021, there were 1,217. Having access to life-saving treatments and medications is critical to reducing these deaths in 2022 and in years to come. Removing prior authorizations for opioid use disorder medications is both an access and an equity issue. Prior authorizations for these treatments are an unnecessary administrative burden that can delay access to care through extra documentation, approval wait times, and medication disruption for individuals with an opioid use disorder. Um, as they talked about, the bill was passed in 2017 to prohibit prior author authorizations for AUD medications in commercial insurance plans, and it's time that low-income Marylanders enrolled in our public insurance program have the same access to care. Uh, and with that, we urge a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you. And we're going finally to Dr. Joseph Adams, MD. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm uh, Joseph Adams. Um, I'm an addiction medicine physician speaking on behalf of the Maryland DC Society of Addiction Medicine in support of SB 323. Prior authorization by design is a barrier to prescribing and it works. Opioid use disorder, which is also known as OUD, is unique. Your sound is going in and out if you could be nearer to your mic, yeah. Is that better? Yes. All right. Um, opioid use disorder is unique among the substance use disorders in that a medication first approach is absolutely required for the great majority of people affected, uh, certainly at least 80% of people with moderate to severe opioid use disorder need to be treated with medications. Um, our approach to the overdose crisis is to some extent off track uh, rather than uh, uh, overemphasizing distributing naloxone, we need to focus more on access to effective treatment for OUD, including medication. There's a severe shortage of primary care and other providers to prescribe for these patients. Public health officials around the country are trying desperately to encourage more health providers to prescribe, but prior authorization for medications makes this harder at a time when we should be doing everything we can to reduce barriers to effective accessible treatment. Uh, for example, in France in the 1990s, when barriers to prescribing buprenorphine were essentially eliminated, prescriptions went up tenfold and overdoses dropped by 80%. So we should take a lesson for that. If anybody is uh, dubious about uh, my statement that um, about the need for medication first for the great majority of people with OUD, there is an annotated bibliography in the written testimony that summarizes decades of published literature. Uh, we, uh, even the terminology MAT is uh, now getting out of favor in the, uh, in the literature because the term medication assisted treatment implies that medication is something other than treatment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions? Okay then that ends the testimony on that bill. And we're going finally to Senate Bill 241, Senator Augustine Behavioral Health Crisis Response Services 
988 Trust Fund. Thank you, Chair Kelly and members of the committee. Uh, Senate Bill 241, Behavioral Health Crisis Response Services 988 Trust Fund. This bill establishes the 988 Trust Fund to provide reimbursement for costs associated with designating and maintaining 988 as a universal telephone number for a national suicide prevention and mental health crisis hotline and developing, developing and implementing a statewide initiative for the coordination and delivery of the continuum of behavioral health crisis response services. As a matter of federal law, beginning in the summer of 2022, 988 will be the new easy to remember phone number for um, the National Suicide Prevention and Behavioral Health Crisis Hotline. Uh, 988, uh, the expectation is that 988 will be available around the clock, 365 days a year. Calls to the line are to go to counselors at local crisis call centers who can provide free, confidential advice and emotional support for people in distress. Counselors can also help connect people to community health and substance use services uh, at moments of crisis. Now, we know that we have a behavioral health crisis. We know that five times more Marylanders, um, we lose five times more Marylanders to suicide than we do to alcohol-related uh, car accidents. Um, and then we know that our rate of suicide has just been growing um, steadily. We also know that um, in our current infrastructure uh, for the suicide prevention hotline, 85% of those calls are being able to be answered um, in a, a, a timely manner um, in state um, versus in the past in 2018, that number was as high as, as um, 92%. So when those calls go out of state, obviously to those backup call centers, um, you know, callers are often on wait times longer. Um, they're more likely to drop those calls and less likely to be connected with an effective local resource. Uh, this uh, shows how Maryland's local uh, call centers um, who have just done unbelievable work with what they have, which is not in a significant enough amount of funding, really do need um, increases in their resource to meet our current and growing need. So we are actually expecting at least a 30% increase in call volume when 988 goes, um, goes live. And we also know that right now, those call centers um, across the state, uh, some of them are only open for, for business hours only. You heard what I said earlier that the expectation is that the 988 will be 24-7, uh, 365 days a year. And so it's just critical that we um, have this infrastructure in place to support just that. And that's what 988 is supposed to do. 988 is also supposed to just be that easy to remember number um, to divert some of those calls that we heard earlier today that are going uh, to 911 that really should appropriately be going into a mental health and um, mental health number. Um, versus going into our 911 system. That, so this should really help us to uh, not only move these folks into the right place, but also just prevent some of those crises uh, from occurring. Because there is a case uh, where a significant number of, of Americans don't actually feel comfortable calling 911 if they feel like their uh, loved one is involved in a behavioral health crisis. There's a, a certain amount of fear that's associated um, with uh, perhaps interactions with law enforcement and a fear of really poor outcomes. So we wanna be very cognizant of that um, and that we will do our best with 988 to provide a more direct avenue for those who are looking for behavioral health services and for it to remove this barrier to seeking um, those kinds of care in the first place by removing with the, the work of, of really advertising this space of removing some of the stigma that's associated with um, with uh, behavioral health as well. Um, so colleagues, it is for these reasons um, that we, when we match that up with the, the investment that we are looking to do from this piece of legislation, which would include um, a one-time um, $10 million in order for us to get ourselves organized, get uh, our uh, infrastructure together, to be able to adequately get um, what the long-term of 988 looks like uh, together, that's what this piece of legislation is about. Um, it is why I'm asking for your favorable report on Senate Bill 241. Thank you. All right, we're going next to Denise Camp. And all of the witnesses will have two minutes each. Thank you very much. Chairperson Kelly, Vice Chair Feldman, Senator Augustine, and committee members for the time, work, and care that you have put into improving the quality and accessibility of healthcare services for Marylanders of all ages. My name is Denise Camp. 
You have my written testimony. So in the time I have, please let me share a story of a person in our network who has had behavioral health crises that ended in trauma, hospitalizations, and unexpected expenses that could have been avoided if 988 had been an option. The person was in a public setting. Their loud speaking and yelling indicated to bystanders that they were not well, but they were not a danger to themselves or others. There was no aggressive behavior or weapon involved. The receptionist at the location called 911. When the police arrived, they handcuffed the individual, threw them to the ground, and put them on a stretcher to go to the hospital, again resulting in unnecessary forced treatment, medical bills, and expenditures of resources for the situation. And though it wasn't true in this case, people often do not get connection to community-based recovery services. If 988 had been an available option, the resources would have been a mobile response team of trained clinicians and peers, or perhaps a crisis intervention team police officer who has specialized training in behavioral health crisis de-escalization. Either of these options could have helped the person access community treatment voluntarily with less resultant trauma and expenses. Crisis response is a safety net for people who are in a debilitating state of mind. So on our own of Maryland strongly urges a favorable report on SB 241's critical investment in our crisis response system to make sure all Marylanders receive quality, effective, respectful, safe, and real-time support when seeking help in their most vulnerable and difficult times. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, we're going next to Denise Camp. Oh, that was me. Oh, that was I you. just went. Okay. Thank you, All right. Chair Very Kelly. Good. All right, in that case, then we're going to Dan Rabbit. Uh, thank you, Chair Kelly, uh, Vice Chair Feldman, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Dan Rabbit. I'm a policy director at Behavioral Health System Baltimore, BHSB. BHSB is a local behavioral health authority for Baltimore City. Uh, I'm also testifying today as a representative of the Fund Maryland 988 campaign. Uh, this is a statewide effort made up of 65 organizations committed to investments in crisis services and a successful 988 launch in Maryland. Uh, you can see in your packet many letters of support from members of our campaign. The launch of 988 this year uh, in July represents a once in a generation opportunity to strengthen our behavioral health system. And it could not come at a more important time. The COVID-19 pandemic has led to a doubling of the calls that we've seen in Baltimore City uh, at our crisis hotline. Suicide is on the rise. Our overdose epidemic continues to skyrocket. And the American Academy of Pediatrics has declared a national youth mental health emergency. Our, the behavioral health needs of our state have never been more urgent. Thankfully, 988 can make a huge difference. Uh, it came into being because of an act of Congress last year, designating 988 as the new National Suicide Prevention and Mental Health Crisis Hotline. But this opportunity can only be realized if states prepare for this transition and invest in their local crisis call center networks. SB 241 ensures Maryland will be prepared by establishing the Maryland 988 Trust Fund with an initial deposit of $10 million. This figure is based on SAMHSA funded estimates of what Maryland needs to meet the projected need for services. If we don't make these investments, Marylanders in distress will continue to fall through the cracks. Every year, hundreds of thousands of our neighbors go to the emergency room or call 911 when they are overwhelmed and don't know what else to do. In Baltimore, we saw 13,000 calls for behavioral health go to 911 last year. These systems are not designed to serve people experiencing a behavioral health or suicidal crisis. Getting care in the ER is chaotic and can take days to be seen. Interventions by police can be traumatic and further criminalize behavioral health. People experiencing a behavioral health crisis deserve support that is tailored to their needs. Investing in 988 and our local call center network through SB 241 will help build the system that our neighbors need to be safe and well, the system they deserve. Uh, we ask for a favorable report. Thank you very much. All right, we're going next to Bob Linton. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bob Linton. Uh, I am an emergency uh, physician, uh, medical director of the emergency department at Howard County General Hospital. 
and the current president of the Maryland chapter um, of the American College of Emergency Physicians. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to spend a minute expressing support for SB 241. I've uh, been an emergency physician for nearly 23 years practicing in the state of Maryland. And I've seen firsthand the impact of the mental health crisis on our emergency departments. The last two years in particular have deepened the need for access to community mental health services. Um, the transition to 988 as a national suicide prevention and behavioral health crisis hotline represents a great opportunity to strengthen our behavioral health system in Maryland. A brief example I'll give you is uh, a patient that I took care of last week. He was seeking uh, behavioral health services for what he felt was a crisis and he needed help. He called 911 and he was brought to the emergency department by police. Uh, he was quickly seen by an emergency physician, but it took over 12 hours uh, for him to be fully evaluated and, and uh, provide a safe discharge for him back from the emergency department. We had several patients ahead of him, uh, with severe illness. Uh, potentially 988 could have been used for this patient. This would have allowed him to have uh, potentially receive more timely care in an appropriate setting. Uh, this, uh, make no mistake, we take great pride in being considered a safety net for the community. And there are certain patients that uh, absolutely need to be in the emergency department for stabilization. We do, however, feel that, that investing um, in the system, uh, investing in 988 as the state suicide prevention and behavioral health crisis hotline will improve uh, the system and ensure people in crisis get the help they need in the right place at the right time. For these reasons, we urge a favorable report. Thank you very much. We're going next to Rachel Larkin. Good afternoon. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman and committee members for the opportunity to testify on behalf of Senate Bill 241. My name is Rachel Larkin. I'm a licensed social worker and have been hotline director at Every Mind for 15 years. Based in Rockville, Every Mind's 24 7 hotline is the regional Lifeline 988 Center. We are staffed by trained specialists to provide supportive listening, information resources, and crisis intervention, including suicide screenings through phone, text, and chat. Here is a typical example of why the work we do is so vital to Maryland. We received a call from a high schooler in the middle of the night. He was suicidal and holding the key to his father's gun safe in his hand. Our specialist spent more than an hour talking to him. He had both a therapist and psychiatrist to deal with his anxiety issues, but neither had been um, was aware of his suicidal issues and neither had asked. As the specialist listened to him and helped him calm down, he woke up his mother who the specialist spoke to as well. The father joined in and removed the firearm from the family home. The parents decided to watch over their son who agreed to stay safe until he spoke to his therapist. During the conversation, the mother commented she was glad we didn't call the police because they were a family of color in an affluent neighborhood and it would have brought them unpleasant attention. Our specialist saved that young man's life that night. Maryland has only five months until 988 will be nationally and widely promoted and centers like ours will be on the front lines of responding to an expected tripling in volume. Maryland needs to ensure that the existing local hotlines are adequately resourced now and going forward. Currently, these lifeline centers are at capacity and without additional support, Maryland to reach out may be routed to large backup centers across the country. These centers are not familiar with events in our state, such as the shooting at Magruder High School or the nuances of our state's mental health system. Unlike information on referral lines and warm lines, the six core lifeline centers are accredited by the American Association of Suicidology. That means the specialists answering the lines have a minimum of 40 hours of training in crisis, cultural competence, suicide risk assessment, and safety planning. In comparison, licensed mental health professionals are not required to have any continuing education on suicide and may receive little to no training on it in graduate school. These professionals often reach out to Lifeline when they have a client in need. The service 988 provides is not only money saving to our counties, the state, and consumers, it saves the lives of Maryland each and every day. Every Mind urges the Senate Finance Committee to give a favorable report to Senate Bill 241 so Maryland can continue to be the model for a hotline response for the nation. Thank you. Thank you. Our next witness is Lucy Font. Good afternoon, Chair Kelly and honorable members of the Senate Finance Committee. My name is Lucy Font and I'm here on behalf of the Baltimore Suicide Prevention Legislative Work Group established in January 2021 by City Council President Nick Mosby. 
This work group is composed of providers, survivors, advocates, faith leaders, nonprofit organizations, and more, dedicated to decreasing barriers that city residents face to access mental health services and prevent suicides from occurring within our city. Since the start of the COVID-19 public health crisis, Maryland has experienced what experts refer to as a dual pandemic of suicide and COVID-19. From February 2020 to March 2020, there was a 45% increase in calls to the Maryland Helpline. In March 2020 alone, there was an 842% increase in texts to the Maryland Helpline. Further, there are significant racial differences in statewide suicide mortality trends during the pandemic. Among Black Maryland residents, suicide mortality rate appeared to double between March 2020 and May 2020. In Baltimore City, where approximately 60% of our residents identify as Black, these disparities are cause for alarm and a call to action. A 2015 report by the Treatment Advocacy Center found that the risk of being killed during a police incident is up to 16 times greater for individuals with untreated mental illness. Specific to the state of Maryland, the ACLU reported that from 2010 to 2014, 38% of all deaths in police encounters, quote, presented in a way that suggested a possible medical or mental health issue, disability, substance use, or similar issue. Individuals experiencing mental health crises deserve to receive de-escalation measures, obtain trauma-informed care, and be referred to treatment options. A well-resourced behavioral health crisis hotline will therefore reduce contact with law enforcement, ultimately contributing to safer and healthier communities. This bill would designate 988 to be the phone number for Maryland's suicide prevention and behavioral health crisis hotline, and it would also establish a sustainable funding source to support these existing crisis call centers that we have in the state. It's expected that calls to the lifeline will significantly increase when the new number goes live, and Maryland needs to ensure that its existing eight local call centers are adequately resourced to support the influx of calls for help. We know that COVID-19 is going to have a long-term negative impact on mental health and suicide risk, it has never been more imperative for our state to designate and fund a well-resourced behavioral health crisis hotline. And as such, we urge a favorable report on SB 241. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Our next witness is Emily Kamizzi. Thank you, Chair Kelly and members of the committee for this opportunity to testify today. And thank you, Senator Augustine for introducing this bill. My name is Emily Kamizzi, and I'm a social work student at McDaniel College and an intern at Maryland Citizens Health Initiative. As an organization, we believe it is crucial that Maryland's local call centers obtain the resources they need to provide free, confidential, emotional support to Marylanders in crisis. In addition, that Maryland invests in the continuum of behavioral health crisis response services. This is especially important to me because by investing in these health services, Maryland, Marylanders in crisis will avoid chaotic visits to emergency rooms, which recently have been overexhausted due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Thanks to your leadership, Maryland has one of the top healthcare systems in the entire country, and by passing SB 241, we can continue to advance healthcare. Thank you for your time, and I urge a favorable report. Thank you very much for your testimony. Our next witness is Rolando Santiago. Oh, he's there. You need to unmute. Doctor, you need to unmute. You're muted. He's unmuted. His audio just isn't working. Your audio is not working. Or the video. I can see you, but we can't hear you. If, if you would send us an email with your testimony, we'll add it to the record. Okay, thank you. All right, then we're going to Lynn Nash. Good afternoon, Chairman Kelly and members of the Senate Finance Committee. My name is Captain Lynn Nash. I served for 30 years in both the Army and the United States Public Health Service, and I'm a combat veteran. I'm here today as the Communications Director for the Maryland Military Coalition. SB 241 is a good bill. It requires the Maryland Department of Health to designate 988 as the primary phone number for the state's behavioral health crisis hotline as part of a very much needed statewide initiative for the coordination and delivery of the continuum of behavioral health crisis response services in the state. 
In addition to crisis call centers, this bill establishes mobile crisis teams, as well as crisis stabilization centers, something that would have been very helpful to the Magruder students when the shooting occurred in their school last month. Last year, Maryland lost over 657 souls to suicide and over 2,800 to overdose. The number of those who are veterans will never know. Suicide rates have been increasing for the past 20 years, but among active duty personnel and veterans of post 9-11 wars, the suicide rate is even higher, outpacing the average Americans. Did you know that four times as many active duty personnel and war veterans have died of suicide rather than in combat? Today, a veteran trying to reach a VA crisis line must call a 10-digit number, then press 1, and speak with a counselor somewhere else in the world with no understanding of available resources. Shifting to 988 would make the seeking care easier with local resources. Maryland needs a standard national crisis line number, and Maryland needs additional services to meet the mental health needs of our citizens especially veterans. The Maryland Military Coalition is a voluntary nonpartisan organization representing 19 veteran service organizations who in turn serve over 150,000 Maryland uniformed services, men and women and their families. The coalition strongly supports SB 241 and asks for your favorable report. Thank you, Senator Augustine, for sponsoring this important legislation and your continued support of veterans. Thanks. And thank you, Captain Lynn Nash. Okay. All right, we're going uh, next. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. To Quentin Askew. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, my name is Quentin Askew, President and CEO of 201 Maryland. Um, so, 201 Maryland supports our mental health partners in crisis centers with their efforts to address gaps in funding to help Marylanders in need of crisis services. Since 1990, Maryland has been ahead of many states with a dedicated 24-7 crisis line. Um, since 2018, 21 Maryland has partnered with the Department of Health, uh, Behavioral Health Administration to operate the 211 Press Online that currently offers text, chat, um, and access to web services. There are five regional call centers who support Press One, and three of them provide support for the Lifeline, which will be 988. Um, currently, access to crisis services in the state rely heavily on the technology through 211 Press One. In FY21, over 55,000 connections were made for people in need of mental health services. Um, in addition, the Behavioral Health Administration has provided funding for this year and next to support a statewide awareness campaign for available mental health and substance use services through Press One. We, we all know that crisis uh, is time sensitive, and 988. You know, it is dependent upon a 10 digit routing number that reports 80% of calls from cellular calls. So, you know, currently what that particularly means that if someone who was in Maryland, but with the out of state number could potentially be transferred out of state. So we do know that that's currently being worked on, but 211 press one you know, guarantees now that crisis calls within Maryland are answered by local crisis centers. Um, so while 98 is continuing to strive to meet those particular capabilities and geo references, we already know we have some of the infrastructure in place to support until that time is here with our press one routing. Um, while the state will be implementing 988, um, there should be coordination with 201 Maryland to maximize you know, its technology capabilities and build off the strengths of our existing network of crisis centers and ensure efficiency in crisis services. So again, you know, we stand with all of our mental health partners. We are appreciative of Senator Augustine's leadership and support with this bill and look forward to working with our community and state partners. Thank you. Thank you. That ends our oral testimony. We have, I think, eight pages of witnesses who have sent in written testimony, including from Maryland nonprofits, Maryland Coalition of Families, MedStar Health, University of Maryland Medical Center, Verizon, Maryland and DC, Marylanders Against Poverty, Maryland Psychological Association, Maryland Foundation of Suicide Prevention, the Horizon Foundation, um, well, it goes on Catholic Charities, um, their Mental Health Association of Frederick County, uh, they're just pages. So apparently there's a need and there's nobody against the bill. Okay, thank you. Uh, that ends 
Yeah, that, ends that ends our bill hearing for today. And we want to thank everybody who has participated. And I guess this was um, uh, Malcolm.